You're listening to the Cantina Cast. Your home for thought provoking Star Wars talk. Join Adler and Jonesy in breaking down the latest news, trailers, movies, and of course, your favorite characters from a galaxy far, far away. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cantina Cast. My name is Albert Padilla, and this is episode 492 our breakdown of the latest episode of the Mandalorian, uh, an episode entitled the convert. And it's, there's a lot to be said here because <clears throat> on some hands I've heard everything talk about, uh, or people talk about it being very similar to Andor too much like Andor, not enough uh, Mando. We're going to get into all that and kind of talk about the pros and cons, things we liked, we didn't like. And uh, you know, just, I mean, everything really at the end of the day, including some of the big speculation points that I thought, were very important because there was a bit of world building that was going on here, whether you liked it or not, whether this was your Mandalorian uh, vibe or not, there was definitely some world building. And I think we've got some kind of explanations or at least some theories and speculation as to why we suddenly got a a shift in the tone and shift in the flavor of what we've had uh, traditionally. And speaking of shifting and traditional, no, I'm kidding. Jonesy's with us tonight. Jonesy, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. Like uh, cube dude in the chat, you know, saw your, your little title, your little headline says the yellow biscuit. So he's asking where the red biscuit is. And then you, well, that was supposed to be you, but yeah. You know. Well, I, I know I don't really, I don't read social cues very well, apparently. And, or I don't read your <laughs> social cues. We've been, we've been missing out on like you setting me up and not stepping into it. So, well, we need to coordinate this a little bit better than maybe. We yeah. do. We do. We can't all be yeah. the blue man crew though. So. Right. Right. Yeah. But how are you tonight? I'm good. I'm good. I'm a little hoarse. Still got allergies, stuff going on. It just, I can't get over it. Uh, it's brutal lately. It is brutal. Yeah, it's been, it's been pretty rough. And now we got winds here, rain's coming in. So the pollen's not going down. But yeah, so I apologize if I sound like Maud or somebody else. You're just working on that sexy podcaster voice. Hello, everybody. There you go. See, you're on, you're on the, you're on the right path yeah, here. Yeah, Barry White. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, a, a, an interesting episode. Very unexpected, I think, uh, in a lot of different ways for the Mandalorian series. And so it, it'd be really interesting to kind of walk through and, and, and talk about, it's kind of a tale of two episodes, you know, it mm-hmm. two really totally distinct and seemingly unrelated things going on. But yeah, there is still a lot of connectivity with it. It'd be interesting to kind of get through our, our feelings on the episode of what we thought about it in more personal terms. But, uh, in general though, a very, a very interesting episode. Very unexpected, I think, on this level. Because I'm, I'm kind of with people. I, I, I do think it was very Andorish in the vibes, you know, for the stuff that was on Coruscant. I mean, how could you not? There were so many callbacks. If you are an Easter egg fan, by the way, oh my gosh, this yeah. episode, yeah, literally almost every scene, there was an Easter egg for you, and and we'll kind of talk through a handful of them, but I, I listed just, just a few. And I'm like, man, I didn't even touch on any of the really super nerdy ones either. It, right, right. It is just crazy how many there were. So if you love looking for all that stuff, this episode was just chock full of it for you. You just, you're like in a wonderland. And we actually are going to, we're going to kind of skip over the news. I mean, yeah, there's some stuff happening. I don't know, celebration, whatever that is, but yeah, we've got, uh, we've got a number of things that we want to get to in this episode. So let's just jump into this. And I kind of want to, I mean, you've already kind of spilled the beans. Let me let me take the first part here and just kind of talk about my opening thoughts. Uh, first off, let's just kind of, you know, get to the lead story here that I think most people have been talking about and whether this was more, you know, I've, I've seen somebody, they put the Mandor Lorian, right? So they worked the word Andor into Mandalorian not even that with creative. the Andor logo. It's not even that creative. So, yeah, <laughs> well, either way. Um, so here's here's my take on it. Okay, so first off, I would agree, like, it being sandwiched, I think you were using the term bookend when we were texting back and forth. Yeah. Um, it was a little, it was bizarre. I and mean, I say bizarre, meaning it was just different, right? There was definitely a change that happened here. And I think, to be fair, 100%, I think it's probably too premature to say that, oh, this is a, a bad episode because it does nothing or any of that stuff. I think we'll find out eventually at the end, of, you know, by the end of the season, we're going to know more or less what exactly they were doing here and setting up. But I don't make no mistake about it. They definitely changed course in terms of what they were trying to do. This isn't the typical season one, season two Mandalor- uh, Mandalorian show. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think what I think for a lot of people, because Andor had come out and there were a number of folks that just kind of felt like that wasn't their cup of tea, right? A little slow, too much world building, too much dialogue. 
that really wasn't Mando. Mando was kind of like action figures, boom, 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 explosions, space battles, right? Really kind of eye candy, a lot of testosterone happening. And we're kind of slowing the pace here a little bit. And I think that's probably, again, because of the, the world building aspects that are kind of folding in from what we've been talking about, which is kind of like this larger overarching type uh, epic saga ending, whatever we're working towards, right? There's something going to happen here at some point. All these shows, you know, this, uh, Skeleton Crew, uh, Soka, they're probably all going to connect and they're going to have some kind of big epic uh, battle or crossover, whatever you want to call it, right? Right. And so at some point, you got to figure they're going to have to work some of that building that first, those kind of like building blocks of that story into the shows. Mando is kind of like the flagship of the Dave Filoni slash John Favreau universe. So at some point it was going to get worked in where I think a lot of people are really confused is we get a 56 minute episode, right? One of the longest we've ever had in the series. And a large portion of that was this world building. And so, yeah, it does feel like, dude, there's too much sugar in my tea or, you know what I mean? Like there's, there was just a lot here that we didn't normally get. There've been bits and pieces. I'm not saying there haven't been, we've had a, Certainly bits and pieces of the mythology, the larger mythology with cloning and the New Republic and a couple of other things here and there and spatterings. But wow, we got I mean, the majority of this episode was really kind of found around Pershing, who was a really a, at best a minor character in the first two seasons. You know, we didn't really see much or do much with him. And suddenly he gets this huge spotlight. So, OK, so all that said, I get it. I mean, I can feel I can I get where people are coming from. I just feel like it is probably a little too premature to say this was a, a terrible episode or it does nothing for the series or that it's filler. They've got a larger landscape that they're working with here. They got a lot more colors than we think they do in terms of what they're putting on this canvas. And by the end of the season, probably with the onset of uh, these other couple of uh, seasons or uh, shows, I think we'll have a better, clearer understanding of what this all means. But for now. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say I hate it. I actually like the episode. It just was different. That, I'll leave it there. But give me your thoughts, Tom. Yeah, that, that's a great way of putting it, actually. I, I enjoyed the episode. It just felt, it didn't feel like the rest of the Mandalorian series we had. So I understand the difference that people are struggling with and that that shift in tone, the shift in pacing, mm -hmm. you know, it just, it was very, very different. It was very stark contrast from everything else we've had up to this point to where it didn't feel like Mandalorian, like the Mandalorian, right? Now I'm with you though. I think this was a this is an episode that we're going to look back on and we're going to pull things from in the future. So I think to say it was to discard it wholesale and say it wasn't important, it say it had no value or anything like that. Yeah, I think it's very short sighted. Yeah, and I think it's definitely going to set some things up. I mean, clearly it made the connection in with Moff Gideon. You know, mm -hmm. clearly we're talking about where the cloning is going. There's something. Yeah, and there were other undertones I didn't really particularly care for, but you know the yeah. And, but the general nature of what is going on in the New Republic and, and what's to come later on was set up in this episode, and we just don't necessarily have all of the the factors that go with it quite yet. So we, we have to be patient on that front. Now, I will yeah. say this, though. the It was more the structure, I think, of this episode that just confused me. And I, I did call it bookends when we were messaging back and forth because I just felt like they could have left one of them off either put the either put the beginning of it with the end of last episode and then you just mm. you finish this episode going back to Mandalorian we've kind of done that before right yeah. or you finish the 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 second episode with you know this week what they did the beginning of this part and then you just you leave it with Coruscant and then you go back to the rest of it next week right now right. which way it works that when I when I watched this more than one time it didn't feel as abrupt to me. It didn't feel, I, I didn't have the same type of strong emotion or, or response to it in one way or the other. And I'm, not, I'm kind of overselling it a little bit there, but you know, it, I didn't have quite the knee jerk reaction that I had to it initially on that first viewing, but it still felt a little bit strange, you know, but yeah, but I'm with you. I think this is something we are definitely going to look back on. Um, I'm hoping that there's a lot of important things in this episode because we did spend a lot of time with Dr. Pershing. And we yeah. knew we knew that there was more to this character. We we knew that was coming. The the actor has said as much on the red carpet as well that you know there was going to be an arc. It'd be curious if this is the arc and that's it. The mind flayer is you know kind of done its thing with him. We don't really know what that means exactly, but Borgullet, right? Yeah, Borgullet knows the truth. Uh, he'll find <laughs> the truth at least. But you know, so it, again, what what does that actually mean in the in the grander story? So we'll we'll walk through some of this. But how many Easter eggs did you go and point out? I mean. How many different 
aspects. I mean, we had things from like Revenge of the Sith. We had Rebels. We had Andor. We had Bloodline, which was really cool to have a High connect- Republic. Yeah, we had High Republic. We had Rogue One. We had Return of the Jedi. We had the Star Wars role playing game. We had old, <laughs> yeah. we had Knights. Yeah. We had uh, Old Republic references as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there were just. It was it was so cool that Bloodline actually kind of got a reference and a callback here too. I, I just thought yeah. that was really really neat, and I I kind of like eh, got a little giddy when when that happened because the books don't get enough love, right? So sure, sure. It, it was fun when the when those types of things happen. Of course, Claudia Gray is one of our our, our favorite authors. So, uh, but any any others in there? We'll talk a few as we go through the the show tonight. I'm sure, but any major yeah, ones mean, that really popped out to you that were like, oh wow, I'm glad they they, they slipped that in. That was kind of neat. Well, I think you, you've covered all, you covered all of, I think the ones that have. I didn't specify them though. No, we'll get into the specifications. I mean, the, the one that, uh, the one that stuck out for me was the High Republic one. And, and, and to be fair, I know a lot of people have said, oh, it's the, it's Mount Umate from Umate, whatever. I've heard it called different things over the years. Right. Uh, but I'm, you know, on uh, the uh, Monument Plaza, mm-hmm. right? I think what, I think the reason why it's such a strong callback to the High Republic was because we, and I, I don't have the lines, but Lena So has this amazing part in that book when, and I forget how she, she phrases it, but essentially saying like, nothing is, nothing can't be topped, right? On Coruscant, I don't think people realize this on, I'm sorry, I don't think people, think people realize that Coruscant used to be a planet like any other planet. And what we were looking at there was the tallest peak of this planet, right? It was this massive mountain and the city had been built out so much that that was the only visible, like natural structure left or natural piece of this planet and it just happens to be, you know, at that level. And so it looks like it's just kind of any other thing, but that's actually the top of the mountain. And her point, Lena So's point was that nothing can be overtopped, even the Republic. She was trying to kind of send a warning that look, any, everything can be toppled at some point. Right. Right. Um, I mean, I think she was speaking in the context of it. She was saying that they were, the Republic was great. They were strong. They were going to overcome this, but they weren't impenetrable. Uh, the way Charles So wrote that was just so brilliant, I think, honestly. And so when I saw that, I was like, oh, that's cool. But I think when we covered the light of the Je- light of the Jedi, we had mentioned that this thing has been around forever. Like even yeah, back sure. in, uh, even back in the, uh, the legends, uh, era, there were, there was, I mentioned as well, but seeing it in person though, uh, for the first time, that was really kind of a treat because we'd only seen it really in pictures and drawings and stuff like that, but never in person, of course, or live action. So I really enjoyed that one probably more than some of the other ones, but by God, there were a million references in this particular episode. Some people might recognize Monument Plaza also from the Clone Wars, Satine and Obi-Wan wandering through. Oh, yeah, that's right. And yeah, I yeah. believe even Rebels may have been in that same plaza as well at one point. Yeah. Cube Dude says, cannot believe the Chancellor's experience with the mountain was was shown. Yeah. So, so referring to that same uh, scene in that. Uh, yeah, Miss Sunflower called a couple of the books out there real quick in the live chat. Again, if you're listening to this, we do a live chat or live stream at kntacast.com slash YouTube. But yeah, Aftermath and Alphabet Squadron as well. So it was cool. Yep. Yeah. Again, so many, so many. Yeah. The aftermath, yeah. Aftermath, we'll get into a little bit more. The alphabet squadron, I think that was the, the, what is it called? The real rehabilitation of these people. Yeah, I believe so. Um, right. The converts and stuff, whatever that program was called. I think it was first mentioned. I remember if it was given a proper name now, but either way, again, and it feels, I mean, this, it, it's appropriate, right? Because I think the Mando is kind of like, again, their flagship. It is kind of a touchstone. It's been a touchstone for a lot of the live action, but I love the fact that it's now becoming this touchstone for really all of the universe, right? Be, whether it's legends or canon, we're getting to see all this stuff weaved in. And I, it's a tribute to, you know, the writers, Dave Filoni, John Favreau, the creative the creators behind all of this, because it's, it's their opportunity to kind of pull all this together, which is, I think is pretty fascinating. I want to just quickly one thing, uh, because we were talking about the Mandalorian and just how this felt different and a little bit more Andor ish or not. Yeah. Uh, you had said it was kind of a weird format the way we kind of got that's the sandwich. I've heard it called that as well. Well, you know, there have been plenty of stories, whether even the movies, episodes, movies, television series that we've got from Star Wars, where they've kind of weaved in uh, bits and pieces and they were cutting back and forth. Do you think that would have like felt more natural for you? Or do you think it still would have been a little too, I, w- I want to say, uh, uh, exposition, world building heavy, even if they try to work, you know, in the parts of Mando and Bo-Katan doing other things other than what we saw them do? That's a really good question because... Sometimes that'll help your pacing, especially with a really slower, more methodical, more deliberate pacing like we had with the with the course on scenes. And so if you have that breakup, it, it just just changes the tone instead of this grayish, you know, light tone that we had with course on, even though more colorful than we've seen it in other times. Yeah. Like especially yeah. with Andor, right? But 
having you know the the scenery elsewhere just changes you it kind of resets where you're at but again it can go the other way too it can feel like you're just getting tossed around and you're just going a ping pong and it's too much it's too abrupt maybe the scenes aren't long enough to really let you sit in them for a while and, and kind of steep in it before you move on to the next one so i, I kind of get why they let it play out in one long scene i, I mean i don't necessarily argue with that part of it I, I probably prefer it this way like okay let's have an episode that is just dedicated to it even if there's a little something on either the, the beginning or the end just to let you go ahead and just you know move through that whole storyline without interruption because i i am one for pacing like once you get into a pace even if it's a little slower that's not always a bad thing. And I don't think the pacing was too slow. I don't think it was boring by any stretch. I think it was just, sure. right, right. I think it was just really, it was just really deliberate. I think it's, it's the best word I keep coming up with. It was, this was a very intentional, slower burn, even though you could see it coming from a mile away, which sometimes gets you a little bit frustrated, but they wanted to show us some of these things about the re you know, what does reintegration and rehabilitation look like? You yeah. know, how is the new Republic handling you know, bringing in empire people. How have, how is the new Republic maybe in some ways very similar to the empire in other ways, right? I mean, so, mm -hmm. you know, a, a lot of that stuff they wanted to be able to show us kind of this not seedier side of the new Republic, but maybe this you know, more ambiguous side of the, of the new Republic. And we'll, we'll talk yeah. about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but, uh, but no, I, I, I don't know. I, it's a choice. So I, I'm okay with what they did. I just would have preferred one or the other at the end, maybe not both. Yeah. Let's see. One other thing just quickly. And so I texted you, you this yesterday, or maybe it was this morning. I forget now. But I had mentioned that, you know, it was it uh, Kathleen Kennedy had said, oh God, it was probably back almost two years ago now, right? When, when Rangers of the New Republic was canceled, there was this, she did a kind of a press conference and she kind of, or press release, I would say. And she had mentioned that they were going to take some of the story that, had, I mean, they hadn't really directed anything, they hadn't written anything, but there were certainly concepts, story concepts they were going to still try to hit and that they would likely work that into other series. Did this, do you get any sense that this was part of, and I think somebody in the chat had mentioned this too. I think this was last year. I think it was probably the first half of last year because it was talking a little bit about Andor, some things that we knew were coming down the, the pike in more recent uh, terms. And uh, yeah, I think this is probably a bit of that. I think we're seeing some of that of, of the shows that are not going to happen, or maybe that had a, a less likelihood of happening. They've started to weave those story elements back into maybe their primary content, or maybe where they feel like they okay, hey, let's lay some seeds here. I mean, you and I talk about that that Sean Favreau and, and Dave Filoni are doing this all over the place, and we don't even realize it half the time, probably. Right. You know, and so yeah, I think this is definitely a case where this is this is absolutely building some of those things up and then there could be themes here that maybe were intended to be explored. Maybe they will be explored. I mean, again, this idea that the new Republic isn't infallible and there's corruption and there's, yeah, you know, there, there's something going on inside of it, you know, definitely has seeds of what maybe we would have seen in some other content. I think you mm -hmm. had speculated, you know, more like Rangers of the new Republic, you know, and then some of that. And so I, I think whether or not it remains to be seen, whether that, that arc has changed or their directive that they want to pursue is, is different now. I guess that'll all come out in time and it'll probably over history once contents come out. But I definitely think that they are, th this is the effects of, of those decisions in order to maybe streamline the content a little bit and be a bit more, a bit more careful with how they eventually bring this, this event back together. Cause even in the star Wars show this week or in this week, star Wars this week, whatever they call it, <laughs> you know, there was a little scene where he, you know, Favreau's bringing his hands together and they quickly cut away. And I'm one of those people, I think that was deliberate and totally intentional by them, by the, by the way, because he would have, he was definitely about to say an event type of thing. And <laughs> right, they totally yeah. didn't let him say it, but still got the hand motion knowing that it would set the world on fire. And, and you know, sure enough, it, it, it got fans excited. It, get, it got fans speculating. And I know we had some folks on our Discord that were also talking about it as well. So, you know, I, I think clearly... The timing of that can't be coincidental in some ways, it seems, you know. Well, OK, so quickly, uh, some of the uh, just two other main thoughts I have. Uh, number one, I, it wasn't lost on me that both Mando and Bo-Katan got something really important to each other. Right. For, that were that something that was important to them and they got it accidentally. And what I mean by that is you've got it was very intentional. It was a mistake that they got it right. You've got basically. 
you know, Mando getting the, uh, the, 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 uh, dark saber, right. He wasn't trying to get the dark saber, but he got it. Then you got Bo-Katan who suddenly has been like cleansed and now she has like this family. And I, Oh, I, I thought you meant she had a mythosaur. Well, yeah, she, maybe she's going to get a mythosaur at some point, but I do want to ask you just quickly on that, that last part, cause we are going to get into this a little bit more later in the show, but the, the name of the episode is called the convert. Yeah. And if you watch this episode, most of it, you're thinking, oh, this is Pershing. But I don't know the way it ends. I'm thinking, oh, no, that wasn't Pershing. It's Bo-Katan. And this isn't the first time they've done this. Right. We there have been a, t- a number of episodes in all three seasons now where the titles of the episodes have double, sometimes even triple meanings, depending on how you look at it. But right. is it or is it too premature? Are we going too far right now saying that she's a convert? Well, I think within the context of the episode, I think it's definitely I think it's both. Okay. Right. You know, and I, and yeah. it's, it's okay for it to be both. But yeah, I definitely think it applies to Bo-Katan as well, though. I don't see why it wouldn't. I mean, she, man, the, the discomfort you could just feel from her. Like when you look at the different reactions you get from how Din Djarin is taking, welcoming into it, you see him nodding and, you know, everyone's slapping him and he's, he, he's enjoying it more, right? He feels like he's been welcomed back home. Yeah. Whereas they're doing the same with Bo-Katan, but man, she just doesn't know what to do with any of it. She's like, what in <laughs> right. the world is, this is not, this was not what I expected. This was not what? what I was supposed to be coming back into. They're supposed to hate me. They're supposed to still, you know, discard me, call me uh, a, a heretic, all these other things. And here they are saying, no, we're cool. No, welcome mm-hmm. back. Mm-hmm. And so just totally different. So, but again, whether she's a convert or not remains to be seen, but leveraging her and kind of putting her in that position where, whether she likes it or not, she's now part of the tribe. And then, yeah. And by all definition, she kind of is right. Except for the choice to do it, but she's, she chose to leave the helmet on too. And even while she's flying her, the gauntlet, you know, she didn't take it off then either. And now I said they were in a dogfight most of the time. So who knows, but while they were in hyperspace, she should have taken off. Yeah. So yeah, it's kind of curious though. Yeah, no, and I agree. I mean, I think it applies to both and it's, it's not, I, I don't think people are paying enough attention and, and seem to be focused primarily on Pershing as being the convert, but we'll see, we'll see what, uh, where Bo-Katan rides us out. And I got some additional thoughts I'll share a little bit later. The last thing I'll say is, and this is not really, I don't want to put too much on this because it's not that huge of a, uh, uh, observation really, but there were parts of this where I was watching and I was thinking Pershing's like a little Anakin here. And what I mean by, what I mean by that is, you know, he's got the power to do something, right? And he do, he's not really sure. He's kind of like in this gray area, should I, should I not? Uh, he's, he's got his heart's in the right place, right? He wants to do better by science, where he was trying to save his wife. And um, then on the other mom, side, on yeah. the other, he's got somebody kind of whispering in his ear, right? Kind of pushing him saying, hey, no, you really need to do this. You can do this, right? It's the right thing to do. And so he goes ahead and goes through with it, even though in his heart, he probably feels like this probably isn't the best thing goes through with it. And that same person that was pushing them at the very end turns on him, right? Betrays them, uh, leads them into that kind of, uh, leads them into that betrayal. So I'm not saying it's like a, you know, a sub story or any kind of, it just seems like there's some little tiny parallels there. And it just happens to be on Coruscant and the, the opera room should, or the opera house is, uh, you know, a part of this episode, just as it was in Revenge of the Sith. So it caught my eye. I'm not saying there's anything in that, but same kind of concept, somebody doing something they probably know they shouldn't do, won't go ahead and do it anyways. And they get busted by the, the person or betrayed by the person that was kind of egging them on the entire time. Right. Yeah. And I think it was his mother that was suffering, needed an organ transplant, but they didn't have the, the, the ability to do it at the time. There you go. There's another, another parallel, right? Doing it because I couldn't save my yeah, mom. This is how right? I dedicated my life. But again, this, yeah, it goes back to a very nature versus nurture conversation, right? About what brings mm-hmm. out your you know, who you truly are. How do you know who you truly are? It, it, it's so dependent upon the environment that you're in where I, I'm not sure I'm willing to say that he is, I don't even know what the right word would be for Pershing, that, you know, he's altruistic and what he wants to do, that his intents are, are pure and what he, you know, what he's doing. Because I still think my opinion of him actually is probably a bit more entrenched than it was before, which is probably mm-hmm. the opposite of where a lot of people are. Because I, what this episode did, yeah, it gave us the backstory about why he is so invested in cloning because of his mother wanting, you know, she had an organ failure. The cloning technology wasn't available to them. If they would have been able to do this, then he could have saved her or someone would have been able to save her, right? Mm-hmm. So I get the intent, right? That's where we start from. A lot like Anakin. I think that's a great co- uh, comparison. But all it did was it just told me that, that he is ambiguous to everything else around him. It doesn't really matter if it's good or not. 
he will he will sacrifice what is best or what is good in order for what is interesting and what progresses his not agenda but progresses his interests right and what he is actually his curiosities the things he knows he's capable of doing and it's not necessarily from an egocentric type of way like anna can struggle with from time to time but it's more of just like the pure science of it he, he's in love with the science of all of this and that's what's most important to him how it's used is a bit of a secondary concern of his because if that was the primary concern then he would probably say i mean he, he says it himself right you know cloning is is ethically complicated and he's absolutely right it's ethically complicated in our day and age too right we're we're unsure if this is always the right thing to do either right you know cloning animals so you can go and you know feed people with them some people don't like that you now and any other you know, set of reasons but when you look at what he was doing though and the type of cloning that he was doing i know we're kind of getting into the episode but when you talk about genetically com combining the best of multiple people you were trying to create super people you're trying to create a genetically pure individual in some ways you can see where this quickly goes down the wrong path mm -hmm. right and you start to see all of the connections of where this is going in another 10 15 20 years right yeah. in the star wars world not ours but i mean you know so i mean you start to think about those things and you take a step back and you're like hey i kind of get your the, the the amazingness of this discovery and what you were on the cusp of doing but oh my gosh there are so many things that can and most likely will go wrong because I think at the, at the end of the day, unfortunately, Pershing is very corruptible in this because he is so susceptible to people using him just for that science part of it and saying that, no, this is just like what, by the way, communications officer was survived, as I said, she did, Ms. Katie O'Brien. I know. Yeah, you called it. Still has a I special place in my heart, by the way. And uh, so, I, I again, I just, what we saw on screen this week is exactly what, it just reaffirmed kind of what I thought about Pershing. Mm. You know, it's just, that's just who he is. You're right. He's, yeah. He's not maybe not morally ambiguous, but he's willing to not care about the morality if it furthers the science. Yeah, I think that's probably there. I mean, and they did try to humanize him a little bit more by bringing in, you know, the mother backstory. And, and you know, he he seems like a swell guy, <laughs> all things considered. Right. He seemed like an innocent person and he just seemed to be taken advantage of by somebody else. And I, I never I never lost the I guess what they were trying to do in this episode, whether it worked or not. I think it worked for me. I think what they were trying to do is say, look, he really does have good intentions and he's just in a really crappy situation. And I think had he gotten the equipment, I like, there's a part of me that feels like, yeah, he would have done, he would have stuck to his moral obligations. I don't think he would have broke the moral the morality of things. I don't think he was the crazy scientist that was willing to go experiment on, you know, children or really unethical things because that was the empire pushing him. But now that he would be in control, kind of dictating what went and what didn't went, I felt like they were trying to at least say that he had some boundaries there. I don't know that we'll ever know that, honestly, at this point, because I think he's foobar at the, I think he's just mush, uh, which sucks because we didn't really get much of him. Except, well, he got a pretty good episode here, I guess. Um, I want to go quickly to the, the comments because our third member of the show is with us, Lauren. Lauren says, I've always felt like he wasn't a bad dude, but just was stuck in a bad situation and didn't know how to get out. Uh, we've all been there, especially with genetic cloning. Uh, let's see. Gary says con. So sorry. I had to highlight that one. That's a perfect reference to star Wars. I really, uh, like that one. Um, and then there was another one here. Uh, oh, so Miss Sunflower says Pershing is just a science man. Everything he does is for science. And there's some other great questions in here. I don't want to jump ahead, uh, about, there was, uh, I'll just bring it up here, but she says everyone caught that person. was talking about a recent, more successful strand cast right before the Coruscant Noble intro. Is he talking about Snoke or Palpatine's son? I have this question a little bit later, so we'll get to that. Uh, but let's, let's get to that. Unless you had any other opening thoughts, because we're running that 30 minutes at this point for just no, we, opening we, thoughts. We need to get into this. Yeah. And we didn't All even right. do news. <laughs> yeah. We didn't even do news. Right. Okay. So let's, let's start with the, the opening here. So, I mean, we jump right back into where we left off. Bo-Katan is sitting there. I, the, the, I just have one question. Like, what's going on in her head at this point? Oh like, she's got to be completely spooked out. We don't know how long she's been sitting there with her own thoughts, thinking about what she just saw, what she witnessed. What does this actually mean now? But there seems to be some conflict there. And I think she does. There's some great moments in there, by the way. And I don't know if that's Katie Sackhoff behind the helmet or uh, what's in her? Um, Emily Swallow. No, not Emily Swallow. I'm thinking of the the stunt actress uh, that did it. Uh, Bennett, uh, I'm trying to remember her name. Doesn't matter. Bennett, oh, yeah. or Bennett, I think is her last name. But either way, 
there was a lot of physical, uh, there's some physicality to her movement. Same thing with like Mando, right? There's, mo- there's times when they do in- things with their body that says a lot, particularly just to call it out when Paz questions, like, who are you? And she does this little head, like turn with her head to the helmet. Like, you don't know, do you know who you're talking to right now? Kind of thing. I just love that. It was just so perfect. So anyways, but what did you think about what, what was she thinking in this moment? Uh, and then certainly we can just kind of roll right into, you know, him getting up. And then the big question of like, why didn't she tell him? We talked about this and we said, I, I think we speculated or at least think, guessed that she agreed, was not yeah. going to say anything. Right. Now she was just going to walk away. But what do you think about all this and why do you have any uh, reaffirmed thoughts as to why she didn't tell Mando? I think they were sitting there for a while. They were both pretty dry by the time we came back to him and he woke up. So he was, he was probably out of it for a bit. And I, man, she's just staring out at the water and it's perfectly still, you know, she's got to be looking for any kind of signs of life, any kind of signs of movement, any shifts or ripples, because she's probably just in total disbelief. Did I really see what I think I saw? You know, and and I think what she asked in Jaren about, you know, did you see anything down there when you went down there? I think it's trying to see if she was hallucinating, if she really thought, if she really did see what she saw. Because I think it's a part of it's just like she just doesn't, how is this even possible, right? And it's really cool that we got the backstory, though, that that it used not to be that deep, right? And so whatever happened with the bombing has, has created some sort of cavern underneath that's allowed the beast to move around or do something to be able to relocate and, and take up haven in this old layer that he, you know, that the, at least of lore used to have. And so it's really interesting that, that all that kind of moves into that place. But I, I did it reaffirm anything though of what, of what we thought about her not telling. I think it's a, I think it's just kind of an ace in her pocket right now. It's something that she can go back to and lean on. It's something that she knows that other people don't. I don't know if it's a distrust of Din Djarin. I think it's just a, you know, you don't really need to know right now, or at least in her opinion, you don't really need to know. They're still not in that place where they truly trust each other again. She's still pissed at him and still irritated at him. We have to remember that where they end up when they're fighting and they're kind of becoming a great team again mm-hmm. is later. It's not in this moment where they've basically argued. And yeah, she she's done the right thing a couple of times, going to save him in the first place and then saving his butt again. You know, but it's, it's still that moment of like, I don't know what to do with this information. Yeah. And what would he do with it anyway? And I don't know that I trust him to go back and tell his, his covert of of fanaticals about this information either. So let's just kind of keep it close to the vest right now. And again, I don't know if it's as much a, an indictment of him in her perspective. I think it's that she just needs to figure out what is, what does this actually mean? For our yeah, people, it's right. an alternative to the dark saber. I think we talked a little bit about that last week as well. You know, but what? How does it play into the dark saber? Can she slow play this stuff? Where is this going? Mandalore's not going anywhere, and it's not necessarily meaning that anybody's going to go out there and inhabit it because it's not really still super friendly or inhabitable or something. You can go and you know start growing crops and move back home type of thing, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. it's still a slow play, and she has that time to be able to do that. And again, once they in her mind, once they part ways, she goes back to Kalevala, he goes wherever and they split, then she can go back and kind of figure out what she wants to do with all of this. I think, and yeah, I agree with all of that. I think we also mentioned last week that this was kind of, you know, the breaking down of her, her kind of belief walls, right? Yeah. This was a, this was a fairy tale. Like she mocked the little reading that was there uh, at the living waters. And then suddenly it's real, Like right? The fairy tale is real. So what does that do for her belief? What does that do for her faith? Uh, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, maybe she was here, maybe she was sitting there thinking about stories that her father had told her, you know, stories that have been passed down about what the mythosaur is. I mean, we only know from that one brief introduction from the armor, right, that that the mythosaur would rise again and er, reign in a new era of Mandalorians or whatever the heck she was saying. Right. But I mean, there's probably more to it and there's probably other tales, right? But the fact that she saw one and she's probably the first person to see, well, as far as I know, she's the first person to see one in thousands of years. Yeah, potentially. So what does all that mean? And I think you're right. I mean, she's probably just holding on to this and thinking, okay, what do I do with this? Like, what does this mean? And I think at some point this is going to come out. Uh, I still believe that it's Din Djarin who ultimately will go back into the water and, 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 you know, bring it out or whatever that is. Maybe there's some kind of ritual or something. Who knows? But the, I, I, I also questioned whether or not she went back into the water, right? If he's been out for a while, 
could she have jumped back in just to go, let me just make a double check, another look here to see, make sure I saw what I saw kind of thing. I don't know if she would have been able to retrace it. Maybe it moved on, but do you think she probably did? enough time there? Do you think she did? I don't, I don't know that she did. I don't think she did. No, but you know, I, it were me, I would have went back in. Like uh, I need to get a second pair of eyes on this. Plus, it eats you know, a lot you. was happening. And yeah, if it eats you, that, that was a pretty short lived experiment though. Well, yeah, that would have been a bad decision for sure. Joe so, um, <clears throat> excuse me, but the, uh, so nonetheless, she goes, uh, you know, she gets her, he, you know, he takes the vial and, and gets a sample. Uh, we had speculated that her vouching would, would be another way that he could prove. And that actually turned out to be the case. <clears throat> Although you had a good point. Like, what is her, what is her word? What is her word worth to the armorer? And I don't think what we were, we were picking up, or at least we weren't <clears throat> speculating was that. Well, it means something because she's been now bathed in the waters, right? And so she's now been redeemed. So maybe that did something for the armor for her to believe her and saying that, oh, yeah, you were there. I mean, ultimately, it was the big test in the that or whatever that is that uh, they kind of <clears throat> solidified or gave proof that he actually had been in there. But, um, but yeah, so uh, as far as the trust goes, I'm with you, too. Like, I don't I don't think it's a matter of trusting, not trusting him at this point. It's just. It's just news, right? She's got to hold on to this and she'll figure out something. All right. All right. We get back to, uh, we take off to Calavella and, you know, he wants to be dropped off and it feels like this is going to be pretty much the end of it, right? They're going to kind of go their separate ways and go back to whatever she was doing, sulking all day long. She's he was quite cold to her as well. Just yeah, take me back to yeah. my ship. We'll part ways. Hey, I'll be eternally grateful, but cool. We're done. Right. Yeah, it's just kind of business. All right. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, she, then she he makes the invite and says, "Hey, if you want to come back to you know the convert at some point, we could go out there." But you know, can't take your helmet off. She but, invited uh, him to dinner, man. Yeah, no, like come yeah. out for the feast. I mean, you won't take your helmet off, but feast with me, big boy. So here's a question I've got for you, and I've seen a lot of people say that Grogu said this is the way because they both, you know, he says this is the way, she says this is the way, and then he mutters something. Yeah, and then you know everybody kind of ran with it. I didn't take it that way. In fact, I still believe that what he was doing in that moment was sensing through the force that something was about to happen because he's sitting there and he's looking around. I mean, he's not looking at them. He's kind of looking around and then he mutters a couple things and it's longer than this is the way. I don't know why he would even say that. It didn't even sound close to this is the way, but he says something in his like native tongue. And the next thing you know, they get shot at. All right, you guys got the eye roll. <laughs> No, I, well, it, it could be because I had actually I thought both ways. I, I thought, oh, well, what was he, what if he's just sensing the danger that's coming? But the timing, yeah, I got a bad feeling about this, or yeah, something's yeah. not right here. Exactly, but the timing of this is the way, this is the way, and then he's like, rawr, rawr. and yeah, it didn't sound anything like this is the way. But did he try to say it? Did he just echo what he was hearing? I like that. I think that's probably. What I do he, like the. I idea. think he was trying to, and again. I'm surprised you didn't jump all over. I mean, I get why you went the other path too, because you're Albert Padilla and that's what we do. But <laughs> I, I think this is also, why didn't you grab onto this one? Because it's him saying that he's a Mandalorian. Grogu has a, is believing it. He's learning yeah. the galaxy. He's navigated kind of with a droid. He pointed on a dial at least, you know, he, he's making his way. He's making his path to being a true Mandalorian. So that he tried to say it, although not very successful. Still, I think it's terrible. Good. It was a terrible attempt, but that's what he was doing. It was. I mean, yeah, but I mean, you're, I can't believe that you're, <laughs> I'm just giving him a you're, you're giving a, a 50 year old baby a hard time. Yeah. It says <laughs> well, a lot about your character. So some have called me the same thing. So, <laughs> uh, okay. So <laughs> either way, he either said, this is the way, or he said, holy crap, something's happening here. Right. One or the other happened. Why can't you people uh, understand me? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but the more exciting piece was that suddenly we got tie interceptors for the first time in a long time since return of the Jedi. I think, I don't even know that they showed up in rebels or anything else. Oh, they're so, uh, which cool. is really cool. I, I, yeah. To see that many of them. Yeah. The tie interceptor has always been my favorite. I like that Din Djarin actually calls it out. These are not like, like shooting regular tie fighters mm -hmm. and they're not, these things are fast. They're nimble. They're very agile. Yeah. Much more nimble than the regular ties. Yeah. And usually they have a much higher class of pilot. Now the really interesting thing about all of this though is just how many there ended up being at the end of the day. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about the bombing run and stuff, but just why do you think, like, where are all of these TIE interceptors coming from? Because, you know, she says she scugged off a, uh, you know, an Imperial warlord from time to time. Not surprising. I mean, right. she's bo right. But this is beyond what a warlord would have at this, in this era. So, and she says as much. 
Where do you think these are coming from? Do you think this is another future tie-in that we're going to hear about eventually, or is this something for this series more specifically? So my theory has been that the Empire has set up shop somewhere on Mandalore. And so if that's the case, it would, for me, I think it justifies that scenario, right? The being able to dispatch that many TIE interceptors. I'm trying to remember if TIE interceptors, I don't think they used, did they have a hyperdrive? No. I don't think they did. I think that was one of like the. That was the TIE, yeah, the TIE Defenders, one of its big things was that it had a hyperdrive built into it. But yeah, the regular TIE fighters, the smaller TIE fighters didn't, yeah. So either way, like that many TIE interceptors in that area have to come from either a Star Destroyer, you know, of some sort. I mean, there's 20. So I count them, right? When they when they get to uh, Kalavala, there's 20 of them that are incoming when they finally turn around and like, let's get out of here, right? That's a lot. Now, how they got there, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But I think for me, it kind of goes back to at least my theory that I'm hoping is the case that they've set up shop. Uh, it was a lot easier to dispatch them there from some kind of Imperial base that's been on Mandalore this whole time almost kind of as a watch guard because they have been, you know, propagating the the lies or doing the propaganda of how, you know, that's a toxic place. You can't come here. It puts them in exile. You know, it, it removes their power, their, their, their strongest power being, you know, a unionized kind of uh, Mandalore, which has not been the case for a long time. Right. So I think that would be one theory. And then the other theory would be, yeah, like maybe it's Gideon's fleet is here. Maybe they don't necessarily occupy the planet, but they could be very close in proximity. Gideon, Later on, we get word that maybe he was already broken out from this war trib tribunal. He looks like he could be on the loose. So maybe this is his response. I think if that were the case, though, they would have showed him. I don't know why they would have made that secret since we've already seen him. Uh, so I don't think that's probably the case. But who knows? Maybe it's remnants or his second in command or whatever the case may be. We didn't have that information yet, though. That came later in the episode that he, mm -hmm. that he was somehow got loose on the way to the war tribunal. Or that was yeah. the rumor or one of the rumors, at least. But what about you? Any uh, any thoughts on how that would have happened? I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to not talk about the elephant in the room and the, the big blue elephant with red eyes that, there's that, Thrawn. that speaks in a very sultry tone. Yeah, Grand Admiral Thrawn, right? I mean, you talk about someone who can have a sizable fleet. We don't know all the things that are going on. We know it's tying into Ahsoka directly. There's your, we saw we saw the space whales at the in the first episode. So I mean, man, there's just so many things coming together that, that keep leading you down that path that you could at least you could make the connections there, whether it leads there or not. But at least you can make the connections, right? And so that that the, that he would see that as a threat in particular, maybe more so than Moff Gideon, because Thrawn is kind of the master. Well, we can argue, but a master tactician, right? And of reading things and and when you talk about culture and art and reading between the tea leaves it's really difficult to find any better anyone better than thrawn at that so it, it's it you have to you have to at least acknowledge it that it's a possibility i think yeah and again we're not giving it there's no other indications to there's no you know there's no artwork on the tie fighter or the tie interceptors rather that that show you that it's you know, related to the Kamara or something like that, right? You know, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. th there's no there's no direct link to any of it, of course, but it's difficult to at least not mention it because it is such a, we know it's coming. So yeah. is this sowing the seeds? Is this making that connectivity to it from season three into what we might see in Ahsoka? And again, is he nearby? Has he returned? You know, is, there, is there something to that where he's been able to get away from the Pergil or something like that? And where is this in this moment in time? So what's well, remain, remains to be seen, but yeah. I was just thinking like, but the, the question still remains like, why Mandalore? Like the galaxy is so huge. And if Thrawn was going to come back, I'm not saying, and I'm not disputing the idea because I think it would, it certainly makes sense for all the reasons you just said. He's coming. Why not just start teasing it out right here and then? But then I've got to, I've got to ask like, why Mandalore? Like why are, why would this many be here? If it's, if his fleet is around, why would they be here of all places in the galaxy with everything else going on? To me, it's either they stay out in the unknown regions or beyond, or they go to the one place that they know the empires or the new, new republic's not going to go, and there's no threat, which would be Mandalore. I mean, it's a whole, whole hell right now. There's just nothing there, right? Yeah, maybe so. But again, if Thrawn is still loyal to the empire and loyal to the emperor, uh, presuming he knows what happened to the emperor and that we're in this Operation Cinder and, and kind of the rebuilding of the empire in that phase, then it would still stand to say that who is your single biggest threat beyond the New Republic? It would be a unified Mandalore. And if you're starting to get 
inklings that something is going on and Thrawn's very good at having you know his feelers out there now whether how effective that is with the empire versus the chiss is a totally different you know a different conversation but mm -hmm. you know for arguments purposes let's just say that he has feelers out there in some way i mean yeah it, it, there there's some there's some thread there i'm not saying it's a really strong one by any stretch but there's some thread there that he would say okay they are a legitimate threat Maybe more so than the New Republic, because we also know the New Republic, we found out later in the episode, they're decommissioning the Empire fleet, the Imperial fleet, they're decommissioning the Alliance fleet, which is the call to bloodline, right? Yeah. And so we know all these things are happening. So it's paving the way for what we know is coming in a sequel trilogy type of timeline. So right. yeah. that Thrawn would see some of these things potentially if he's engaged at all, and they would start making plans and start to do something to affect some of that makes sense. Now, granted, the other most obvious one is to say, okay, well, we we learn later that Gideon's escaped. He's making plans. Maybe he's got his forces are are coalescing and they're they're starting to be you know to pay more attention and closer attention because that is a considerable threat. And we know his obsession with the Mandalorians. So I mean that's a that's a more obvious connection to make there. Right. I, and, and what what is in the back of my mind still is these just itching question of like why what is the threat like what is going to be the big threat for. Mando or bo or Paz or, the, or whoever it is. Well, they hate the empires. Well, that's yeah. Right. Okay. That's fair. They hate the empire, but somewhere they need to coalesce all these tribes. They're going to call them back. They're all going to call them back together. It, it just, yeah, I could be completely wrong, but they're going to do it. And there has to be a major threat and it has to be an imminent. It has to be a very real threat to Mandalore. So what is it? So the fleet has to be there. Like, oh, well, that's all I'm saying. The Imperial presence has to be there. Let's explore this then. Sorry to interrupt you. Do they need something like that to bring them back together? If you have the dark saber and you have a mythosaur, do you need a threat for everybody yes. to come back still, at least to see the mythosaur? I think they're so splintered that even like, even if the mythosaur came back, they're so, they're so varied in their differences that there's not a commonality. I don't think, I think there are probably groups out there that are like, kind of like Bo-Katan. It's like the mythosaur is cool, but what does that do for us? Like that's not going to go fight an Imperial Star Destroyer, right? It, I mean, it's, it was important to the Mandalorians because it was used at the time to like establish power against other Mandalorians. I mean, it was, you had, I mean, there was a, it, it was very central. Like it didn't, it didn't go anywhere, right? It didn't go beyond that. Uh, the symbolism is not lost, right? but I just feel like, yeah, there needs to be something that cauterizes the, 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 all these teams, all these groups that are so vastly splintered, so spread out across the galaxy. I mean, if they just sent a call out and said, Hey, by the way, we got the man, and I'm not making light of this, but I'm saying if they called and said, hey, we, we, we have the dark saber. Oh, and by the way, we have a mythosaur. Come on back. You know, things are getting better. The weather's great. Don't listen to the word, the things you've heard. Everything's fine here. Amanda, please come back. I don't know that it's enough. And even if it was, the state that they were in at the end of Rebels seemed like it was going really well. But to Bo-Katan's point, things went south pretty quick. And so I just don't know that those are probably enough for them to kind of really rally together. For me, it feels like, if they're following the standard tropes and storytelling, there's got to be some kind of major threat that finally gets them to realize that, oh, we're all one, even though we have our very differences and together we're stronger. Right. Coming together and not doing anything doesn't necessarily prove that they're stronger. That's all I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, so let's, I want to talk about the, the battle because I really enjoyed this battle, honestly. And I forgot to mention to you, by the way, this was the debut of Lee Isaac Chung as the director. Um, this also had Noah Clore. So I think we had mentioned there was one, maybe two episodes, I think, that Noah Clore contributed to as far as the writing goes with John Favreau. Right. I want to say just quickly, the quality of directing on this one was fantastic. It really was. Like, say what you want about the Andor-ish kind of stuff in the middle or even, you know, anything else really about the episode. There was a cinematic quality to the way this film was directed and the way that it was edited. And I think more than anything, it was probably in these action sequence. Dude, there was some really great stuff. Like I said, this was probably one of the best, if not the best space battle we've had in Star Wars live action. And I know that may sound blasphemous because we've had some really great ones, especially Return of the Jedi, which is one of my favorites. The opening of, of uh, Revenge of the Sith comes to mind, right? That right. epic scale that we had. But it really was incredible. And there was two particular shots I just want to call out because I want to just kind of quickly touch on some of our favorite aspects of this battle. But one for me was Mando jumping out of the gauntlet of, and, and as he's falling, you get those tight, the interceptors kind of flying right over his head. I was like, Whoa, that's kind of nuts. We've never seen anything like that before. And then later on when there's down to one, I think Mando, they go around the mountain 
on each side. Mando comes around. He shoots down one of the interceptors. Mm -hmm. And they cut to Mando's cockpit, but the camera is to the right, of, and they're focused on the cockpit. You suddenly see the explosion blow over the top of his cockpit. Then he moves the camera just slightly left, and it frames on that last TIE interceptor crossing over your left-hand shoulder, chasing Bo-Katan off. Right. That whole little action sequence, go, I mean, just watch it. It's like eye candy. It's like your, your mind and your eyes are just going everywhere, and it's pretty easy to follow, I guess is what I'm saying. So I really enjoyed those particular moments. But overall, that and then the whole little, you know, pulling the handbrake maneuver thing. We got that. We got the death from above. This is now the third time I think he's done this. He's done it in season one, season two, and season three, where he kind of goes into this free fall, you know, effect and, you know, head on with the other uh, TIE fighter or whatever he's shooting. So. All in all, it's great stuff from an action sequence perspective. Yeah, bo gets the uh, best drifting award for what she pulled yeah, for her move. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, this just in, Albert, uh, the Mandalorian Din Djarin is calling his, is not the Razor Wing, it is the Bat Wing. So he is, the Bat Wing, yeah, well, that was, yeah. He's officially called it the Bat Wing, because that was straight out of Batman, which was, like, I like that. I think it was fun. I I thought that was one of the cooler moments of Batman, <laughs> actually, when you frame the, frame the, the yeah. Bat Wing against the moon, but. I'm with you though. The way that this framed up, I like that when he, when, when Dinjar is coming in head on, because this is a, this is the dumbest strategy, by the way, no one fights like this head on, you know, but I like that the realism, he, <laughs> he looks cool. He shoots the cannon and, but he pulls up so that you don't run right through them. Like you, like you see in the, in the star Wars movies and before, and like they did in the original trilogy a lot, right? You go pew, 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 pew. And you go right through the, yeah, you know, everything explosion is explosion of yeah, particles. Yeah, it's particles, right? Which is dust. Which is just not the case. But I like that he actually pulled up. And to your point about the camera, as you're as you're focused on Din Djarin, there's enough space on the side you can see the remnants of the explosion falling behind the the razor wing or the N one. I'm disappointed he keeps calling it the N one. <laughs> yeah, right. He does need to call it the razor wing. I am with you on this one, hundred yeah. percent. But I like that we had a lot of. You got to keep the scale of the battle without losing the energy and the enthusiasm and the excitement of the battle, right? Especially, you know, when mm -hmm. she's in the rocks and we've seen a lot of, we, we've seen a lot of these before where you're, you're navigating the terrain. We saw it in previous episodes of the Mandalorian as well, but a big lumbering ship like this, you know, going through and, and the mastery, a little bit of the humor that comes through with Bo-Katan talking with R5 as well. You know, it, it, it was just a really grim mix and it was just really entertaining. It was just a lot of fun to see, you know, and then whenever you get to the point where the, the bombers show up, you're just like, Oh no. I mean, and she says, no, you know, you're usually, like, yeah. Oh no, it's happening again. Like you just imagine the trauma, you know, coming out of that and just, she just sees red all of a sudden, right? Just everything just goes completely red for her. And she just wants vengeance because the last thing that the empire hadn't taken from her, you know, her family, like the, the last piece of her family, the last piece of her lineage, you know, they've, they've come to finish the job. And they finally do finish the job in a very similar fashion to how they took the rest of Mandalore from her and from the rest of the Mandalorians as well. So it was very powerful in that kind of way. But I'm, I'm, I don't know if I call it the best Star Wars, you know, action sequence battle that we've had, but it was definitely, it was definitely up there and just really enjoyable. And again, I think the TIE Interceptors, I've always loved this ship because it's the most, it's one of the most difficult ships for, for anybody in the Alliance to take out or any, even in this era. And so I like that we did still get their due. And this is why you have the N1. You have something as powerful and as, as agile and as fast. And, and it, it's a, it helps level the playing field a little bit. And let's just talk about them coordinating and getting along and really playing off one another and having that mutual respect at the end, which is great. I mean, are you ready to ship these two or not? Come on. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, you say mutual respect. We're, that was last episode. This is all a bit, this is all like so filling all, each other out like as, far as, play, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, concerned. it's for it's foreplay at this point. I mean, him saying, you know, not bad for an antique, right? Um, and then when he said nice shooting, or I think if she said nice shooting, right? Yeah. And he kind of nods at her, he's winking at her. You just can't see it under the helmet, but he's winking at her like, I'm picking up what you're putting down, lady. I, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> so, I mean, they're a thing at this so point. So you moved, uh, oh, you've and, moved on from Omera then? For now. Yeah. I mean, they're just, they're the power couple, uh, like, uh, yeah. Lauren had said last week, they really are a power couple, which would be great. Now, Amara still has a role in all this, but that's, you know, that's for the fanfic at this point, which we'll get to you later. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they're, I, I do feel like they're, they're flirting at this point. So, uh, we get to, the, let's talk about the bombing just quickly. Um, you know, where did they come from? All that stuff. I mean, I, 
I don't know if this was specifically targeted at them, but you know, it could speak to Gideon again, wanting to go after her for what she did. It could be just part of the, Hey, you know, we've taken care of Mandalore. They're starting to, they're, they're hearing rumblings of Mandalorians kind of creeping up. So let's just put them down now before the, you know, escapes. And they may have been watching her knowing that she lives here, but she's been without power for so long and just kind of a nuisance. And now it's like, no, let's just go bomb the hell out of her and, and be done with it. And so either way they took it out. I mean, now conveniently, from a plot and storyline perspective, it kind of resets her, right? That coupled with the fact that she's now bathed in the water, the living waters and, and kind of been baptized and purified and starting anew. This is kind of a, at least it's an opportunity. I'm not saying she's going to entertain it like we talked about earlier, but I think she realizes that, okay, I don't really have a home anymore, right? They just bombed that. We established in the first episode, I think, or the second episode that all her followers have left her because she doesn't have the sword. So she's got really no commitments. Her family's all gone. But what has she got left, right? So, I mean, she's got this and, you know, she's been bathed and or cleaned or whatever, and they've accepted her. It's kind of family for now. And, you know, maybe they'll just kind of see where this goes. And I think someone said it earlier in the chat as well. She could be playing the angle of, look, I need to rebuild my forces here. I need to, I'm still the rightful leader, but I can't lead unless I have people to lead. And so this is all the family I got. These are only, these are all the peasants that I have right now, wherever she looks up upon these guys, right? Because I still, I still think she has a high horse that she sits on at times. Oh, yeah. Which is fine. I, I love her for that, right? She is the heiress. Uh, but, you know, maybe she's just kind of rolling rolling along, see how things go. And when there's an opportunity, she'll jump on it. But I think they've set it up perfectly for her there. Yeah, I mean, it was a little bit convenient that she needs a place to go, right? And, but it's a good way to escape. And again, we want these two to, to team up anyway. And we want this. This is the story we want to, right? So it just makes sense. And again, I like the idea that the... Uh, man, this the, but this is where it like really leans strongly into Gideon being the the one behind all of this because this is vengeance, right? This is yeah. retribution. Yeah. This is finishing the job. This is adding salt to the wound, and and just going down that and, and targeting her specifically, you know, rather than Mandalorians as a culture or as a as a fighting force or anything like that, right? Yeah, because again, the, the coverts are lying low, and when they've come up, they've taken heavy losses. So. I don't know that the Empire really, or even a Gideon, would necessarily give them a whole lot of credibility at this point as being a true threat. But again, he he's a he's a smart guy, so he's going to go and you know leverage his bets there and and make the right call. So there's um, and I, we'll we'll come back to this. Well, of course, we're going to come back to this. But that's that very next scene when they're kind of when they get off the ships and they're walking in, and it's him, it's her, and Grogu's in the like they, they look like a married couple with a newborn in a stroller. And I, I was thinking they're like darks or dwarks, right? Dual income with kids or dukes or whatever they're called. Dual income with, with kids. I've never heard this before. So. You never, you, dinks and du uh, dukes, you've never heard of this? Okay. Honestly. Well, there you go. Look it up. That's the acronym. Dual income with kids. Austin hippie thing. <laughs> Maybe that's what it, I don't think it's an Austin thing. But yeah, they did look like a, you know, a young family, a young budding family that uh, just needs a home and a lot of weapons. Okay, so let's go to Coruscant because this is where we cut. They jump into hyperspace and we don't ever see them again for the next like 50 minutes or so. Um, we open on the Coruscant. I thought the music was good here for the first time. Like, I shouldn't say that. That sounds terrible. I've, I've enjoyed all the music, but particularly in this episode, by the way, during the fight scene, I enjoyed the music, but it was so like in the background. Yeah, it was not. I mean, it was, or... and I had to like turn it up and I was like, yeah, this is kind of cool. Like, why didn't they crank the volume? Just give it a little bit more gain so that we could hear it. It actually wasn't bad. I really enjoyed it. Uh, but the the music here, uh, when they kind of did these establishing shots of Coruscant, I thought was really good. It don't, didn't wreck, didn't sound familiar to me in any way. <clears throat> we got the opera house revisiting that. And now it's being, you know, you've got Pershing doing his equivalent of a TED talk down there talking about cloning. And I really enjoyed that whole piece. Like, I thought he was uh, amazing in terms of his acting, too. Like, I thought that was a really good piece. I think he's weaker a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Katie. I know you like her. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm, uh, what's her name? Um. Uh, What's her character's name? Oh, uh, well. Kane or Bane. Oh, Elia Kane. Elia Kane. I don't believe that's her right. name, by the way. But. Well, whatever her name is. Like, I, there were moments when she's just really good acting, and then I think there's other times it's like not, but that's not it. I think she used to be a wrestler like, or something, right? So, I, I, Oh, really? I have no idea. Yeah. And she could take me, that's for sure. Well, most people can, let's be, let's be honest. But the, uh, the speech that he delivers, I thought was really good. He mentions that there was one individual who was intent on using cloning technology to secure more power for himself. Now that seems very specific, right? It doesn't sound like, 
it's not like, oh, the Empire wanted this for dubious reasons, which we can't get into because this would be too long of a show. Do you have any thoughts as to who he was speaking about? Is it the, uh, the what was the guy, <laughs> the client, right? Or was it, is it Gideon? Is he talking about Snoke? Is he talking about Palpatine? Is there someone else here? But he sounds like he's referencing someone very specific about wanting the power to use for themselves, though. It's not like, oh, we want you to do this because we want you to claim, you know, clone a body for the, the emperor at some point, you know? I don't know. This was a little confusing for me. Yeah, I think we have to we have to check ourselves a little bit and just remind ourselves that Pershing is a patsy. I mean, he is not he's not informed as to the great the bigger picture. He is just he's just the help, effectively. He's the brains, but he's still the help. And so I think he's probably talking about Gideon because I don't know that he I don't know that he has any other perspective except for the one giving the orders. And we know back from season two that he was, you know, in the hologram message when they find the cloning bodies. You know, we know that he was addressing Moff Gideon directly. And so I think everything was reporting there. And so I think from Pershing's perspective, and granted, you and I know better. We we both know there's a bigger picture going on here. It seems like it's for the Emperor ultimately, right? Yeah, right, right, right. But I think from him, I think he is talking about Moff Gideon directly because that's also the one that they've imprisoned in war. And everyone else in that room is probably going to, you know, equate to that as well. And they understand the brutality and the criminal nature of what Moff Gideon has done and what he is, continues to be capable of. So um, that that's kind of where I lean on that one, that he is talking about getting, because I just don't know that he has any other, you know, scale to to base any of that on. And I think we got confirmation that he was using this cloning, these cloning techniques, for, even back in season one, we had speculated that they were likely trying to clone force sensitives, right? These super soldiers um, kind of thing. But um, so all that was good confirmation. You know, he leaves that TED talk and goes outside. And this is a weird, like, so we're, and we'll get into this too, as, as this episode kind of continues on about the new Republic and just what, who are they? What do they stand for? What do they mean now compared to like, you know, uh, how different are they from the Galactic Empire and how different are they from the Grand Republic? But they're, they're almost kissing his butt the entire time, which I thought was odd, right? I mean, rich people are weird anyways. You never can tell what they are truly mean. And sometimes they're honest and they seem dishonest, but they're not. Sorry. But I, I still just had it. They were, I mean, they were talking about, you know, oh, you're so brave. You're so inspirational. They were gathering around him and he's kind of looking at him too. Like, this is kind of weird that he's now a celebrity right in their eyes, you know, and it could be that they're looking at him as, you know, an investment maybe at some point, uh, you know, maybe they're on the corrupt side. I don't know. It's hard to say. There is that the interesting uh, quote that uh, that one uh, senator or whatever high profile person said, empires, rebels, new republic. I can't keep track. So we just don't get involved, essentially, is what he's saying. Right. All of this echoes a lot of what we had seen and heard in novels. Um, you know, you could even talk about like The Last Jedi. Nothing really had changed there. I think about, you know, um, who was it? Uh, DJ, right? When he's talking about. One day it's the resistance and the next day it's going to be the new order, right? It's all the same to them, but it does feel like at least from this episode, and we can kind of dig into this more here now, even though it comes up a little bit later, but it does feel like they're really not the greatest group. And I think they try to sow these seeds back in, in bloodline, but it feels like it's hitting a lot harder. And I don't know how that settles with me. I think I'm fine with it at the end of the day, because it, it kind of plays into why the heck they got off of Coruscant and went to Hosni and prime it speaks to what Leia was saying and why they spun up, right, the resistance away from the New Order. Because we even had, there was even um, in one of the junior novels that was leading up to The Force Awakens, and I totally forget the name of it now. But one of those junior novels had a, a story in there about a senator who was at the highest levels and was corrupt, was still working for either the Galactic Empire or the, the New Order or the First Order. I forget which one it was, but they were, they were essentially a bad guy that would have been risen to power. And so maybe there's some of that that's at play here, but it does speak to what Dan Jardim was saying too. Like the new Republic is kind of a joke and nobody takes them seriously. And they, ha they seem to be making a lot of bad decisions. Uh, everything from the stuff we've already talked about to naming people with numbers instead of giving them real names. So I guess, what are your thoughts on that? How does that settle or I guess feel for you knowing what we know and what you've thought all along? Yeah, it was uncomfortable. I'll say that much. But I, I did distinguish between the New Republic and these people. But these people really 
reminded me of the denizens of Cantabite. So I'm glad you brought up DJ because it this very much reminded me of that one where they are just on a completely different plane than of existence than everybody else. They just don't care who's in play. It, it's a, as long as they are, they're opportunistic, as long as they get what they want, they really don't care. And they're totally buttering him up, whether it's for his research or for the promise of his research or whatever it might be. And he plays right into it though, too. He's, you know, well, it, yeah, you, I, it's nice to be on course. At least it's not the outer rim, right? I mean, he's even playing right into it. And you're just like, really, dude, you're going to go and bash the outer rim now? I mean, Grant, you could say it's better than the conditions he was in under the thumb of the empire. You could probably make that argument instead. But within this group of people, it just played right into their hands where he's just kind of soaking this up. And again, this is where I question the, you know, the true altruism of of Dr. Pershing to where he's not, He's not immune to these types of things. It's not all about in science or not all about, you know, saving people. Uh, I, I, but I had to really disconnect between this is not reckon. This is not representative of the new Republic. These people have always been here. These people were here in the, in the days of the galactic Republic. They Fair. were here in yeah. the empire. They're here. They're always going to be there in some way. Right. Yeah. Now what we see later on though, with the new Republic, I have a problem with. And we'll, we'll talk about mm. it because I, that, that really did kind of rub me the wrong way a little bit about, uh, about some of that with just how Star Wars has been positioned, you know, historically. And we've talked a lot bit about that, but we'll, we'll kind of get to that in a little bit. But yeah, with these people, I, I had to kind of disassociate with some of that stuff. It was, the speech was good. The, the speech was interesting. I agree with you. The acting was, was a lot of well, fun here. I did like the emotional side of the story, you know, getting that aspect of things, but also knowing that, you know, it's, there's something just not right within all of this. He's touching his ear. What does that actually mean? Is it a, rem mm. you know, what, what is it a reminder of for him? I don't know that we ever get total clarity around some of that, you know, until a little bit later on where it's a little bit of resentment, but in this moment, what does it actually mean? Or is this just his nature trying to come out? I, I don't know that I have a good answer for some of them. Quick question. Is Mom Mothma still part of the Republic after Leia left for the resistance? I don't know the answer to that. And I don't know that it's ever been explored. She's still around. But, uh, you know, where she is and which side, I would imagine she probably goes to the resistance and not like I can't see her being OK with what's going on in the Republic or the new order. How about that? The new Republic. Sorry. If she's even alive. Um, if she's even alive. Yeah. Like we have no reason to believe that she's dead, but we don't know that she's alive either or dead either. Either way. Yeah. And there, there's some there's some comments about the ear. And I know, yeah, that's where Cara Dune shot. You know, she shot past to get to the guard behind him. So I know he's wounded there and, and things like that. But. Um, he pulls on it twice. He does it in the speech, the TED talk. And then later on, he does it right before. He does. And Kane is doing the oh, same thing it? with her uniform, right? So it's some sort of a tell. There's some, there's something associated with it that, uh, that that's, there's something behind it. I just don't know exactly specifically what it is in this first moment. The second one, I have a pretty good idea. It seems a little more obvious at least, but in this one, it was just a little bit, a little bit less clear what, what it was that was going through his mind in that moment. Yeah, and we've, I think it was this episode or last episode we talked about that there was another character that was doing something. And if, it, if there's nothing really telling about it, then the only thing I would say is that some actors do find a something to go to, right? This acting, I forget what it's called, uh, but it, it's just something that, that establishes a character, gives it more depth, right? Um, yeah, grabbing in the hands or, you know, putting their, you know, whatever it is, there's yeah. all kinds of things that people do, actors do to kind of get into that character or stop, create more, you know, realistic ha you know, habits and twitches and stuff like that. So, sure. I mean, it could just be that, I guess, at that point, but, um, okay, let's talk about the amnesty program, which seems seriously flawed, but I totally get why they're doing this. Uh, apparently you have to make it into the program. It's not like everybody comes in. So it seems like they're, you know, weeding out people that are just really crazy or fanatical in some way. So that sounds like there's at least they're gating the people that come into it. Um, you know, he's on his way. They're providing these houses. Oh, by the way, that droid, did that not look like the concept art for 3PO for Ralph McQuarrie uh, that he drew? A little bit, but the ones on the train seemed a bit more. Uh, more no, that's more true. They did seem a bit more. But yeah, there was definitely some old school McQuarrie reference in this yeah. episode. But they go to the... Um, Oh, you mentioned the, the, I have it in my notes, but the, the man of bog of Malastar that he's talking about, which is from the star Wars role-playing game, the D 21, not the D six. Right. Uh, but they go to the convert and the, or the convert, they go to the, uh, the housing 
And this is where this is like, okay, what the heck is happening here? Why are we regressing? They've, they've given these people numbers, right? M34, L52, G27, M40, G68, G68 is a lie. Kane. I, I don't really understand the point of all this. Like, it feels like, oh, you're part of the system, but we're still going to treat you like you're not part of the system, right? It, it's, it does feel like we're digressing here just a little bit or regressing, I should say, uh, is what I meant to say, regressing to you the days of, you know, the empire or, you know, giving people name or numbers instead of names. And I just, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like this is, maybe this is the part that doesn't sit well with you. Like, why would we go back to that? Why are they doing that with these people? Yeah, this was the first, yeah, this was the first time it really hit me hard. I'm like, I don't like this at all. Like, I don't understand. We want to give people back their identities in the New Republic. We want to show you that you can reintegrate and you can be something better than you were with the empire and that you are valued in this government, in this society, and you can make a contribution as an individual, but also contributing to the greater whole. Having a number and your peers referencing you as L52 at work and on at, at home and everything else just spits in the face of all that. I just, I'm, I'm totally confused why the New Republic would be in this, like adopt this mentality. It just seems so stupid to me. I, it's, it's, it really frustrated me. And, and some of the stuff we saw later on too, and this is the part that that starts to rub me a little bit about, you know, to kind of step out of the story a little bit. But, you know, George Lucas was always very, and we're not, you and I are not George Lucas purists, right? We're also very realistic about where stories need to go and how they need to evolve and they need to adapt to the cultures that we experience in real life and be able to tell some of those stories as well, right? Not just good versus evil, black versus white. So taking all that out of it, though, for a moment, it was still very clear, though, that we had, you knew who to root for. And you knew that you could rely on at least the the intent of the organization of what they were trying to do. And this is this was the first kind of sign of like, what is the new republic doing? That like all of a sudden now I can't trust. Like I mean, it gets it gets more overt later on, but I can't trust what the new republic is doing now with with this. That they're supposed to be the shining beacon. They're supposed to show me that seven years, almost ten years after Return of the Jedi, after the fall of the Empire that we have made some sort of progress. Yeah, they're struggling. That's totally cool with me. You know, it, you need to be able to have something that you feel is, is important for you to real, to rely on and for you to lean back on it. That has that support, even if it doesn't work out and it has fundamental flaws in it, you don't go and adopt the tactics of the enemy saying, this is a better life and a better world. And you don't show that to the people you're trying to rehabilitate. It, it just confuses me to no ends, Albert. Mm hmm. Tell me, back me off the cliff, man. Get me off the cliff here. Get well, I think Lauren, Lauren will probably do it for you. She says, were they doing that to try to keep people in the program anonymous? Like for the sake of not wanting people, know, people knowing about each other's ranks or specific past roles in the empire. Pick a new name then. Don't give them a number. It just, True. to me, it sounds like you have just telegraphed who they are. L52. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, you have a number. Gosh, you must be one of them imperial jerks, you know? Mm -hmm. No, it's like the witness pr protection type of program, right? You you give them a new identity, but you give them a story to go along with it, not a blue uniform with a specific badge that I think it, the uh, the letter was A, I believe, right? For the, uh, gosh, what was this program called? The uh, Amnesty program? Yeah, Amnesty. Yeah, a for Amnesty. So, I mean, you're telegraphing that who these people are, and then they have a number, and you don't even call them by their names. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. I like Qui-Gon Jay came with, I'm condemned, I'm condemned to use the tools of my enemy. So referencing, uh, and or there. Yeah, exactly. Let's see. Uh, yeah, the numbers sound bad. Pseudonyms would have been better than a number, says Lauren. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Sunflower says the New Republic is trying to snipe Jonesy's internet. That's probably very true. And Gary chimed in saying they just restored the corrupt Republic. So I think, uh, no, I'm with you. Uh, overall, like it's, it's just optics. The optics of it all are bad. Yeah. Like I, this is, doesn't feel like it's just a bad decision. I mean, I get what the, we can justify it whatever way we want to, but at the end of the day, because it, because there's such a negative connotivity with giving people numbers, especially what we went through with the Clone Wars for as long as we did, I don't know if that's really the smartest thing to do. Uh, it seems like it would be better to give them, like you said, new names and put them re, re put them back in society through a, a different program, you know, making them wear specific uniforms and doing the dog and pony show and all that stuff. I don't know. It just seems kind of in the best. It doesn't seem like in the best interest of the people, but it's probably in the best interest of somebody at the top for doing all this. We just don't know what that is yet.
Yeah, I mean, it's, See, I'm with you. It, it, Gary put it out there. Taste. It's Operation Paperclip, you know, from our own real life story of re bringing in the Nazis and, and giving them a new, you know, purpose, right? In order to help us, you know, go through the Cold War and, and all those good things. I mean, it, it good things, all the terrible things, but I mean, I, I get it. I just don't. Well, here's yeah. the, I, and I, I agree that's the same. And conceptually, conceptually, I think that's the same. The difference, though, is that we actually utilize their strengths and their, you know, all of the intelligence and their skills. And Pershing gets, he's a pencil, a paper pusher, right? He's sitting there decommissioning equipment. Like, that is not the right use of this person. And I get maybe because of his background, you know, I mean, all right, maybe it's, you don't want to get him in a cloning lab because you don't know what's going to happen with that guy, right? I get that. But, I mean, he could be repurposed for something other than sitting there doing what robots, or droids could be doing. Like, I don't understand why there's a human factor involved in that at all. If he wants to help people and he wants to help cure a disease or something like that, if there even such things exist in Star Wars anymore, you know, yeah, give him more of a medical type of career. Yeah, no, we don't do cloning. That That's off limits. That's uh, the part of the course on accords. They not allowed, you know, zero. But that doesn't mean you can't go and study. And like you said, put your skills, skills to good be, use. Yes, thank you. So Lawrence says, I can also see they can't just let war criminals run around with no supervision, though. And that's a good point. So here's here's what I was just thinking to you. Like, maybe this was like we're probably being unfair. Like, we don't know the extent of this program. Maybe he starts off here pushing paper and they keep monitoring him and he's going through the psych evaluations. And at some point when they like, you know, check the box, maybe they work him, they move him into the next phase of that. And maybe that's utilizing his skill set more. Right. Uh, who knows? We don't know what the program is. So. I want to jump too crazy all over this thing because I, I know a lot of people are chiming in. I think we all agree it's kind of weird, but who knows? We we don't know the full story just yet. Um, okay, let's move on because we get a quick update as they're kind of sitting around. We already talked about this, but, you know, the rumors about whether or not he escaped uh, in route to the war trib tribunal. So maybe he never even went through that. It was interesting. One says there was a cover story. Uh, they toasted and said, long live the new republic. And I'm like, my goodness, why don't you just say long live the empire? Because that's, again, I mean, and there's just echoes of this, right? Remnants of it. And maybe that's just them, right? And that's all they know. And so they just kind of, oh, let's be fun. That's, they were being cute and let's replace empire with the new republic. But if the new republic is going around saying this, again, just probably not the best decision. I would change some of the verbiage there. Um, and then let's, let's talk about, uh, we're not going to go through every detail. But I had this section in here called the exposition of Coruscant and the amnesty program, because now between now and the point where we get to them leaving to the naval yard or whatever they're, they're doing the decommissioning or the tearing down of the Imperial Star Destroyer, there's a lot of exposition that's built up here. <clears throat> and I think this is where people like were turning off, like Rondo had chimed in and said it was boring, right? He didn't like any of this stuff, right? And this is the world building stuff. And I think this is the stuff that's going to play into a little bit later. Some of it's not, some of it's just, hey, here's. Here's a look at Coruscant in a way you've never seen before on live action. That's okay. I really don't have a problem with that. Um, but we got them mentioning the uh, Ecumenopolis, right? That Rick Olay talked about back in Phantom Menace, uh, that it was the center of the galaxy, but not really the center of the galaxy. Um, there is, you know, there was, they talked about lightsaber pops and photon fizzles. Uh, they thought they were doing good. These guys thought they were doing good. They actually weren't. We got the Monument Plaza stuff that we already talked about. Uh, the Easter egg, and I know somebody mentioned it in the chat here, but the, uh, the March of the resistance is playing in the background is kind of like this carnival theme music as they're there in, in Monument Plaza, which is really funny because we got the same kind of thing with like the empire, uh, during Star Wars rebels, right? An empire, empire day, uh, we got the, the Imperial March, uh, version of that as well. Uh, but I do want to talk about one thing. So one thing that, that came out during this whole almost 15 minutes of the show, they were talking about how cloning now is kind of frowned upon here in, in the new Republic, um, which is probably a good thing. Right. But they, when he was talking about, he's talking to that psych droid and she says that uh, cloning and genetic research is prohibited by the course on accords. So it doesn't sound like there's an appetite for this whatsoever, but yet Pershing believes that, Hey, they just don't know what they don't know. Right. If I can show them what good looks like and I can show you, show them the benefits of it then I think they'll come around to it. But why would they be against cloning, uh, uh, you know, on the whole? Like, I don't, I didn't really understand why. Like, it seemed like it was largely successful when it came to what happened with the clones. Now, granted, how they got there, 
probably wasn't the best. I mean, the empire didn't like it, but it surely heck worked out for the grand Republic. Yeah. But it's so easy to be corrupted in that, in that sense. What are you going to do with this technology? And again, you look at what they were developing and what Pershing was having a talk about. You were talking about splicing two genetically ideal people into one more genetically ideal person. Well, that, so that part I get, like that part I, I totally get, but the cloning them uh, the principle of cloning is what I'm saying. Like right. they were against pr- cloning and genetics at all, at all costs. And like, that doesn't seem, uh, maybe they got back to. Right. But that's fundamentally why. that's the, but that, that's where you keep coming back to is, is the risk of it being abused and the risk of, of the people being corrupted and the, the risk of that science being used for ill. I think is still just way too fresh that, you know, we had a whole clone army. Yes. It, it helped fight a war, whether you want to say that's a good thing or a bad thing. Probably a lot of people, you'd probably a very strong argument was a terrible thing to do. Uh, but it, at the same time, it's a, you know, it's just, it all happened behind your backs too. And you had one group of people control all of it and you had, oh gosh. And, and then just all the things that we know they're trying to do, all the, all the, the, the behind the scenes activities that could be taking place that you just don't know about. And you have these special scientists and what are you going to do to control that? You're going to put them in a room and in, in their own housing and keep them under wraps so they can't talk to anybody. Do you trust if you're a people and if you're a Senate, do you trust your people to be able to do that? Given where we've come from, I think the answer is continue to be no, 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 no. And I'm with you. I mean, cloning, from, from purely what Pershing was talking about, cloning an organ to save a life, cloning some, a smaller piece that can make a difference is, is admirable. It, it has value. It, has, it, it should be important to be able to further along. Unfortunately, it sounds like this government is willing to sacrifice that because of the fear that goes along with probably well-deserved fear and, and well-earned fear of the reality that the galaxy and the people who would get a hold of this are, we know there's an Imperial remnant. What if this survived and they got those people and they fired all these things back up? I mean, the risk is just too great, I think, for the New Republic, especially in this younger era. I mean, you have to remember the New Republic is the first government post Clone Wars that wasn't an empire. And yeah. so it's all right. still very much there. We can't repeat the sins of the past. And so they've got to steer in this very different direction, I think. Yeah, Gary brought up a good point, too. He says, we might see that why they are anti-clone yet with the Bad Batch. Clones running off to where and do what? They said they go crazy in Legends, and it would be surprising if that was coming. So, yeah, I mean, I get it. Like, it's it wasn't bulletproof. Uh, there were a lot of things that were still wrong with the clones. Um, but I think, again, uh, what he was what he was pushing for was, again, the cloning of organs. And I think if really that was all they all they did, I don't think anybody would be against it. But to your point, yeah. In the wrong hands. In the same speech, he talks about cloning an organ and then cloning a perfect human being. <laughs> right. And they're like, whoa, this is cool. I was on this board when you said that, dude. No, they were all still like all super excited and happy, right? All the rich, corrupt people were, were lining up to meet True. him and shake hands. I mean, yeah. here's your sign. So, and then let's talk about just Elijah Kane's kind of long game here. And I, I want to get to this. I have this at the very end um, as a question. But what was, who is she working for? Gideon. You think she's still working for Gideon? Yeah. I mean, I think that was the case. And I've seen, I've seen a lot of people just kind of gloss over that. And I don't know if that was, if it's just so, it, it was so in my, in your face for me, or maybe I'm missing something here, but my read on this was, yeah, she had been pulled into this thing and she's working for Gideon, you know? And I think what she was looking for was, look, is this guy really a believer? Does he believe in the cause or is he just a good hearted person who really loves science and we're not going to be able to get him back because he now has a moral compass because he's working for, you know, the new Republic and no, that, that turned out to be the case. And so she just fries his brain, right? Okay. We're done with this. And she could be covering up things as well, but I never got the sense that she was truly working for the Republic. That, I mean, even, even still like, okay, let's say, I mean, I guess she is, I mean, I'm not saying she's not working for the Republic because it's very clear that she is. She could be working for a corrupt arm of the Republic that somehow reports to Gideon. I think that's a conspiracy theory that's out there. But nonetheless, the fact that the it's again that the New Republic is even doing this, right? That they're baiting people. I don't know. It doesn't it doesn't sit well. But at the same time, I get it. I think my, the bottom line though is I don't think she's loyal to any but anyone but Gideon, and she is kind of a, a planted person 
in this amnesty program for the benefit of uh, the remnants of the empire and specifically Gideon. Yeah, and this is part of my concern about the New Republic in general and in this gray area of, of can you trust the New Republic, period. And because I think, yeah, I think she's a loyalist, right? I think she's an imperial loyalist and a specific loyalist to Moff Gideon, you know, specifically. And yeah, that he's embedded people, even if they get caught, they know what to do, right? We, we've seen what, what people are willing to do for the empire and what they're willing to do for Moff Gideon. We've had people commit suicide multiple times. We've had, you know, people, even when they have an opportunity to make a better decision or move in a different direction, they don't believe any of this stuff. They believe in the imperial narrative and that's it. You know, and we have to remember, and, and Miss Sunflower you know, posed in the chat, is she just trying to climb the amnesty rank or is she trying to deliver Pershing's research to Palpatine's headquarters in Coruscant, as it was in Legends? We have to remember that Abyss is a planet in the deep core. And there's a there's a potential link to some of how this stuff works with Palpatine with, with the deep core as well. I don't know if it's all out in the outer rims and stuff. There's got to be something still entrenched in the middle of the galaxy. You know, and how some of that might tie in. And now I know that's legends and, and all of that, but there's there's truth in legends sometimes. And I, I believe that's how they address some of that in legends. But regardless, it wouldn't be that far of a jump if she were to get research or get something to be able to start setting that back up, reestablish a lab somewhere nearby, however they want to do that, or if it's more mobile, it doesn't matter, I guess. But mm -hmm. anyway, I, I, yeah, I just think that she's, that's what she cares about. I mean, that's that's clearly what, that's her job there is that I'm always serving the empire's needs that, you know, just end of the day. And granted, I think they may have been feeling him out a little bit of saying, okay, is this someone that, yeah, we can bring back in the fold that believes in the cause. Yeah. He believes in the science. That's great. We need people like that. We can manipulate, but does he truly believe in it to where we can keep him around? And when you fast forward to the end, whenever they decide to, to mind flay him, and she decides to my flame, I guess, because, hey, let's leave a convict in with another convict, unintended. Sure. Makes a lot right. of sense there. Yeah, the commissioner is dumb. But anyway, but it, still, she has to make the call about whether or not this is someone you want to have the risk out there, right? And again, he's he's kind of turned on her at this point. And so there's there's no choice left for her to make but to, to fry him. And I don't. it doesn't really seem like she has any issues with it at all. I mean, she's sitting there eating the yellow biscuit you know, as she watches. So it wasn't like she was torn up over it, even though it seemed like yeah. maybe she was going to be. But at the end of the day, she's like, yeah, I'm going to sit back and enjoy the show with my, with my little treat. I was calling them dark side cookies or dark, dark side biscuits. I think I like that better than yellow and red, but to each their own. A lot of the notes. She does a good, yeah. I mean, she does a good job too, you know, talking about, um, you know, she's playing them the entire time where he, he says the words, you know, I thought we were doing good. You know, she plays into the, the how much he wants to do the research. And oh, she yeah. even says, look, if it's going to help the new Republic, then, you know, isn't that enough? That you, have enough. A, you have a responsibility for it, basically. Right. I know you're absolutely right. She was definitely picking up on all the cues and she is a, you know, she's a master manipulator, you know, apparently of where she can take those cues and turn them right back around and use them against them in order to further you know, that her agenda. Yeah. It, she says, um, you know, following orders blindly was what got us in this position, right? That's, <laughs> what, that's exactly yeah. what we did at the empire. Um, and then eventually he goes and asks the question of the psych droid, but she's a con artist in that regard. Right. And I think we've talked sure. about this in other things, but the, the, the telltale sign of a good con artist is getting you to say what they want you to say. And that's essentially what he's doing. She convinces them to say and commit to doing something that he originally didn't have. And he thinks it's his own idea. Like he, she does a really brilliant job of, of manipulating them and conning them into thinking that this is his own idea when it really isn't. It's her, right? She's been feeding them this entire time. Um, so they get to the Imperial uh, yards and, you know, he has, a, he has that really quick moment where he's kind of looking in the mirror and he has that Stuart smiley, you know, moment where I'm good enough and this is the right thing to do kind of thing. Right. But in the background, we hear that chanting monk music. And I won't say it's a Snoke theme because it's not, but we heard it in season two of the Mandalorian, right? I think it was in the siege or one of the episodes when they showed the clones or the, the, the strands that were failures. Um, so I think all of this is just kind of, you know, signaling that this is the, again, more of the, the Snoke uh, uh, experiment and, 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 you know, ultimately trying to get a clone body there for Palpatine. Sure. Uh, we get them riding subways, which was kind of interesting to see uh, Tong's day. I've seen a, billion memes on this already 
Uh, but happy Tongs Day to anybody uh, that celebrates, yeah. uh, although it was yesterday. Well, and the other thing is that the data cards that he got that second round, like she planted all that stuff. Right? Mm. She, she put all of those in to make sure that he understood that, hey, this medical equipment still exists. Right. Yeah. That was all super intentional. But that, that, that goes to show you the reach that she has and that she can't be doing this alone either. There's got to be an embedded group of people or a team of people or high up that have permeated the new republic in this regard to find loyalists and to find opportunities to bring those people back and get them into the fold and, and, and somehow pull that back around to the empire. So, I mean, all of that right. is very intentional. So it wasn't just the conversational aspect of it. They have resources and they have pull within the, within this amnesty program as well. Yeah. The empire and the new Republic did them dirty. There's um, they kind of have that little moment there where they finally, you know, share each other's real names and, you know, person he's talking about his mother. And I mean, you can see it in his eyes. He's like fascinated by being in this lab and talking about how he always wanted to be in there with, you know, when his mom was a doctor or whatever she was doing and, you know, all that, the aspirational dreams that he have, which is all kind of sad given where this all ends for him. I mean, yeah, you, you, you feel good for him for a minute though, right? He's like finally yeah. coming out of his shell. He, you can see that youthful enthusiasm for, you know, progressing science and just making a difference, right? And right. just the, the youth, just the, to be able to see that through fresh eyes. Even she has a moment before she steps back into the shadows, of course, you know, where she gets almost caught up and swept up in a little bit. Yeah, she was talking, I don't know if this is the moment she, you were referring to, but she's talking about how she never got a chance to really kind of even, you know, think about what she wanted to do. She just kind of got pulled in. Right. You know, my guess is we'll probably know more about her. I think she's going to stick around as a reoccurring character. So maybe we get some backstory into, you know, how she got tied up with the Empire. And she said she served there on Coruscant as part of the, at the Academy. Uh, but she may have been drafted at a very early age for some reason. Maybe she's got some abilities. Oh, she's force sensitive. That's what it is. Oh no, there's gosh. probably a reason. No kidding. She's not. Not yet. Until they experiment on her. Okay, so um, they, you know, they try to get out of the way, get out of this death, the Star Destroyer at this point. Uh, the alarms are going off and they get caught by the New Republic. And this is where he gets, you know, uh, betrayed, I guess, by her. Um, right. So all that was very sad. Let's talk about the Mind Flayer, though, because that's really the next part here. This is a very disturbing scene for me in a lot of ways. Uh, everything from the fact that it's being administered by a Mon Calamari who seems to be pretty okay with all of this and seems to have a very pleasant voice, but sounds absolutely nutso the entire time he's talking about this. Uh, what is it? A, a 602 mitigator, you know, still experimental. It's been approved for re rehabilitation. It soothes. It's got, a, you know, uh, soothes select traumatic experiences or memories is what he says. It's got pleasant colors. You know, there's, pleasant buzzing sounds and the great sense of release. I mean, he's almost like trying to really sell the idea that this is going to be okay, but went through it myself. It's yeah. Great. Yeah. He's like, I did it myself. But at the same time, I mean, I'm thinking Bix from Andor, like this is like, this seems very unethical that they're even, this is even being entertained. Like, why would they do this? So I don't know. Again, another red flag for, I think what the, uh, the new Republic is trying to do. I mean, Maybe their hearts are in the right place, but this seems like a really wrong way to go about something like this. Right. Yeah. And it, it was funny. Actually, uh, Gary just made the comment that it was the, definitely it was a, it's a trap. Can't you see this is a trap? And the, uh, the Mon Calamari. his eye, like he turns like, hmm, this should mean something to me as a Mon Calamari, but I don't know what that is just yet. Actually, uh, step back for a moment. I, I swear up and down the voice actor for this Mon Cal is Dan Aykroyd. It sounds exactly oh, like wow. Dan Aykroyd's yeah. like cadence for his way of jokes and things like that. It yeah. sounds yeah. so much like Dan Aykroyd. And I'm wondering if this, I don't know if I didn't, I didn't get a chance to look at the credits to see if they gave anybody. He's not credit. in the credits. I, I looked. No. So I wonder if this is uncredited to Dan Aykroyd. Cause I know he's been kind of involved. I think he's been involved with Star Wars before, uh, but that would be really cool. But yeah, I mean that they, again, this is another problem I had that they repurp. Oh, let's take a step back. That they, that they repurposed Imperial technology, not necessarily a problem that you left it able to fry someone's brain, I have a problem with. And calling it experimental, experimental would like put a governor on it to where you can't turn that knob past a certain dial. Right. Or you've throttled, you don't put enough power to the room. I mean, there's so many different ways you could do this. You know, but that, <laughs> that they thought this was okay and it seemed like it was working great. I mean, apparently it it is a... It is a uh, a reputable way of rehabilitation, right? Again, I, I think it was more just to get you to relax, but that they still allowed this thing to be turned all the way up 
And again, convicts, monitoring convicts mm. unsupervised is absolutely ridiculous just because you trust, you know, someone that, that they're the shining star of your program. I mean, it just, I don't know. I, I just, yeah. uh, do better. You were public, do better. Yeah. I mean, again, and uh, people are people, people make decisions and things like that. So, and I know it's not fair to maybe lump all convicts the same way or people who are convicted of crimes. They do rehabilitate, they do rejoin society. They can be great. But in this case, we know better. So this is more specific to this one. You know, you just, it's difficult to just, I mean, they haven't been here that long. All right. At most they've been there is like a year. Yeah. At most. The one line that, that now that you say that Dan Aykroyd, when he says, when he says, you're going to wipe my mind, he goes, absolutely not. This isn't the empire, son. That line right there, the yeah. empire's son, that's like Dan Aykroyd. So I'm with you. I'm like all in now on, on this theory. So hopefully that turns out to be true, but interesting. The music here was creepy too. If you listen to it, it's almost like creepy elevator music that's it happening was. in the background. Yeah. But it was sad though, because, you know, he's screaming while he's being strapped down. Why did you set me up? And looking over to her and she seems to be at first kind of like, oh, you know, sad, like, oh, you know, this is, he's crazy and all that. And of course, later on, she's almost relishing in, in what's happening, which is kind of sick and, and twisted there. All an act. Yeah. The, yeah, the, but the I mean, first part had to have been, I mean, it kind of felt like it was genuine that she was like, had a moment of regret, but I think it, she did maybe, but it I was think just a moment. And then when they were one-on-one, -on -one, she didn't have any, any regret whatsoever. She had no yeah. hesitation about what she needed to do to the point right. where she's just going to sit back and watch the barbecue. Yeah. Because there's a <laughs> barbecue. Yeah, there's a moment where there's a couple moments where one, she's kind of looking away. Like she can't even watch parts of it right when they're kind of strapping him down he's struggling then there's a quick moment there where she looks uncomfortable and then there's a brief moment when they're kind of panning over from the side and you see or she takes like a big swallow like yeah. you know nervousness about it all and of course at the end she gets past all that because now he's strapped down and he's not making any noises and she turns cranks it up to 11 or whatever she does um starts eating her little biscuit there but yeah the fact that i mean talk about total negligence and just being like Sure. Why not, kid? You want to fly this machine? Go right ahead. I'll step right out here and, and I'm sure everything will be just fine. You know, whatever. It's convenient for the plot. And I, I guess the question, though, regardless of whether or not to, you know, how it all came about is, is this the end of Pershing? Like, do you feel like we're going to see him again? I, I think if they had left it at three or whatever not she was he was at originally, then maybe he comes back. But I was getting the sense that this thing got red. It went from blue to red and he looked like he was in pain. I, I think he's been lobotomized for all intents and purposes. And it's probably, it probably plays into Gideon's kind of purposes because one, if he's not going to come over, he potentially could be a threat based on what he knows and the knowledge that he has. And so why put that in the hands of the new Republic? Just get rid of him. Right. Oh man. My first reaction is why would we waste a character like this? Hmm. I mean, literally waste a character like this where we've not that we've invested a whole lot in Pershing. But there's been enough there about what's going on. And again, he's a loose end. So I understand tying that up as well. But it just seems like we would be, from a storytelling, we would just be completely throwing that character away. I'd like to think there's probably more for him, but it's really hard to tell. We don't know how long he's in the machine for. And we don't know how much of the lasting, how long does he have to be in there before the lasting effects, before your brain just turns to goo, right? I mean, because that's the easy thing is that he's just, like you said, can be completely lobotomized, kind of complete, drooling over himself and unable to formulate a complete thought for the rest of his life? Or is this more of a process where you have to flay him over time kind of thing? You have to flip the steak a couple of times, I guess, in order to get it to get, you know, cook it all the way evenly or all the way through. I don't know. Mm. You don't flip steaks, by the way. Don't, don't do that. But anyway, so it's just a, I don't know. I, I would like to think that they haven't just completely blown this character off, but the way they leave it, I mean, that's what they wanted us to believe at the very least, but I, I don't know. I honestly don't know in this case. I think we will revisit him, but I'm very concerned about what will go. Now, if you go back to Bix, though, and Andor, you know, she was heavily incapacitated with the torture device and things like that, and she was able to make progress towards being herself again, and presumably she will continue to be. So maybe there's hope that this isn't necessarily permanent, that it, it does, it would take, sustained viewings or sustained experience of all of this for, you know, for him to go through this experience over and over or to truly have permanent effects to where he is still something of a functioning character. I, I would hope that mm. would be the case. I like the character of Pershing enough to where I hope we haven't just thrown him away. 
Yeah, I hope so as well. I think the only thing that I like that idea, the, the only thing I don't like that probably could happen is the fact that with, with Bix, it was a torturous thing, right? It was just traumatic and experience. And you would think over time, you probably can recover from that, even though it was, you know, pretty emotionally disturbing. Right. But this seemed like it was in the, what he said was this uh, wiped away memories. And so I don't know what they were trying to wipe away by going to three. Exactly. Maybe this any any thought or idea that he could be part of, you know, what was once the what he was the work that he was doing as part of the Galactic Empire. Maybe that's what they were trying to wipe away. But going to 11 or joking, but whatever they crank that thing up to, it seems like that probably is going to wipe away a lot of memories, too many memories where he's no longer even remembers who he is or what he used to do. You know, what would be cool. And I'm not saying they're going to do this, but if there's one person that could fix him and it could be a returned favor is Grogu. Like Grogu being able to use the force, go into his mind, re- restore him, heal him in that way would be a kind of a, a sweet little moment in season six that we get. Or maybe this is how we see Grogu unlocking his own memories at the Jedi Temple during Order 66. No, oh, maybe. maybe Pershing is force sensitive and it comes back on Grogu. <laughs> oh, stop it. You're just playing right into my little uh, orchestra here. Okay, well, enough of Pershing and that group. Let's get back to the final moments here. Uh, we get back to the cult. I'm sorry. Uh, we get back to the con- the, the family. The family. The family. Um, right. But then it does bring her to meet the family. So it's you know getting serious at this point. Um, <laughs> he says there's the secret location, right? This is how they've existed for so long. She's like, yeah, I know. Um, he says they still live by the old ways, and she has to keep her helmet on. Which I'm, I'm now she's just rolling her eyes at this moment. Like oh, you're right, you're really like taking you home to see mom and dad. Look, this will set my mom off. Don't do this. Yeah, I don't want her to hate you on day one. <laughs> right. Don't mind dad's shotgun that'll have out at all times. Uh, dad's a blow. Uh, dad, that dad, dad'll blow over. He'll, he'll, you'll love him, but mom, she's a bit of a hard ass. Yeah. Don't take that helmet off. <laughs> <laughs> right. So they show up and of course they're greeted by Paz. who's kind of a, a big jerk. I, I, I like Paz. Like he just, he's a great he's welcoming a, committee, man. Oh yeah. Like nothing says we've missed you. than Paz showing up of all people, <laughs> big party foul that he is big doofus. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, they, they kind of challenge like, hey, you're both apostates, you know, especially you. And, uh, you know, we already talked about how she was kind of looking at him like, bro, do you know who I'm talk- you're talking to right now? Like, do you even know who I am? It was cool that she knew that he knew that she was a night owl, though. I thought that was kind of cool that they were still. I mean, you got the decoration. all sure, of that. Sure, sure. But that he knew that she was a night owl, but didn't recognize her status in the night owls, I guess. Maybe yes. there's not yeah. enough markings to differentiate. But, yeah, I, I did like that he called her as a night owl, though. And they're very distinguished. I mean, even if you look at all the other clans and the people that are they're running around with right now, they don't all have like, you know, very significant markings that, that kind of specify their clans or the group. So Yeah, they're definitely not ornate in that kind of way. They'll have a sigil and that's about it. Yeah. I mean, these guys looked like they were just piecemealed together from whatever they could find. They had different colors. Three year old with a crayon box just <laughs> Right. Yeah. The color the color palette was pretty limited. Um, it was like eight bit color for most of those guys. But yeah, they uh, they he mentions that the uh, clan crease has fallen from the way. It's kind of a dig on her, you know, whatever. They end up going in. He says, "I've got proof," and so they allow him to come back in. And then we get the whole, the meeting with the armorer. He takes a vow. We mentioned that she kind of threw it in the water there. I don't, there's got to be some special magical properties about the water now, right? I mean, yeah. I never put two and together two and two together that she, that's what she was using in season one and season two. And I forget exactly when she was doing it, but now it's like, Oh yeah, she was putting crap in the water or putting stuff in whatever that was. Yeah. And it was doing things and they did the same thing this time. So it looks like that is it's at least legit from that perspective. Um, but you know, she didn't, she didn't balk at Bo-Katan saying I was there. I was a witness. I saw the whole thing. I was really surprised by that too. I, I mean that she was just, but again, I think this, maybe this speaks to the armor. The armor doesn't really hold, well, she does hold grudges, but when you when you follow the way or you do the thing, she she is such a staunch believer that the rest of it just doesn't matter. If you have been redeemed in the eyes of the Mandalore, then you are redeemed, and that's it. You have a blank slate. It's like nothing happened before that. At least none of the transgressions have happened before that. Mm-hmm. And you are back on equal footing with everyone else. You are now part of the family again. And that's a really interesting... It, it, it put a different spin on the armorer for me because i really thought that there might be something of a grudge it makes a lot of sense for her just to say hey all is forgiven 
as long as you're here, you're, and you, this is the, the, the way is to invite you back into the family, which I really like. This is such a pull from legends as well, that when you lose your way and you lose your, you lose your clan, you are basically adopted into the next one. If that's what you want, right? You're welcome to stay here. You're welcome to, to partake in ours, enjoy the, the bounty that we have as one of our guests. And as a, as a, you know, at least a temporary family member, if not a potentially, you know, permanent family member. And so I like that that type of thing is in place, but I, I won't lie. I was a little bit surprised though. The armor just was so casual about it. Like, yeah, cool. Welcome home. You can stay here yeah. with us. We got it. We will fix you up a room on the side, park your ship out in the back. Be fine. Watch out for the crocodile in the front, but yeah, it's all cool. Otherwise. Yeah. They keep showing up. Yeah. It was very much, uh, it was very olive garden when you hear your family kind of thing. Uh, not to quote that uh, slogan, but you had asked, you actually had asked the question last week. Like, so what does this mean? Like, is she bap is like, she been cleansed too? I'm yeah, like, guess so. Well, yeah, we got an answer. She was too. And it all kind of played into the story here, but she says, I don't walk the way. Right. Well, yeah. It goes to confirm that the rest of what you say and all of the words and all that crap don't mean anything. It's literally you, you were cleansed by the waters. The, the rest of it is just hyperbole and just pomp and circumstance, I guess. Mm -hmm. And that, that was an interesting thing that the, the words didn't necessarily mean, didn't necessarily mean anything in that way. And not a bad deal for her, right? Like we talked about earlier on, like that all worked out she hasn't well. removed her helmet. She's been cleansed. Um, you know, as long as she, she can stay there as long as she wants. They're not holding her against her will. Right. They've kind of invited her to stay as long as she'd like to, and she can leave whenever. But, you know, so they, this is the way. And then they all kind of come, they all kind of put their arms on her shoulder, which is kind of like that Mando greeting. And I mean, she's got to be feeling like at least accepted, even if she doesn't, like, I, I still feel like she's kind of like, Ugh, don't touch me. You she know? was, you could tell she was, whereas Din Djarin again was like nodding and like, yeah. Yeah, like, like yeah, right. Like right she's right. like, what is going on? Cold. Like. I did. That's what she's thinking. Oh my God, these guys are crazy. I'm going to die. Well, but also this is not what she expected to walk into, right? She expected yeah. to be treated like she always yes. has been as mm -hmm. not only an apostate, but just as a, as a wretch in some kind of way, right? Just the, the, the evil person that, that helped to destroy their culture. There's so much with clan Kree's that's, that's embedded you know, in the, in the, the way the Mandalorians view the family at this point. That you could just tell that she was just in utter shock. She's like, could this day get any weirder? Yeah. Saw a mythosaur. Well, it was, went to Mandalore, bailed this Joker out. Uh, you know, saw, got him out of a spider who was really creepy looking. Uh, decided to go bathe in the waters, which weren't supposed to be there. Thought they were going to be destroyed. Saw a mythosaur. And now I'm being invited back in by this clan of cultists. And then my place got blown up too. And everything's told, oh yeah, my house got blown up too. Right. And everything seems to be kosher. Like what is happening? Like, <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I mean, this is like the, this again, you're right. This is not what she was expecting. And so I don't know, this could be a good thing for her. I wouldn't, I wouldn't hate it if she came over to the, the, I think she's going to have a lot of problems. What do you, what do you make of her with the lingering shot on the, on the skull, on the sigil, on the wall? What, what do you make of that? What do you think is going through her head in that moment? As she looks, all these things are happening around her. She's seen the mythosaur and then she sees the symbol of it on the wall of mm -hmm. this, of this group. What do you think is actually going through her head in that moment of like, do you think she's buying into it at that point or considering it? Like maybe this is a way for me to, to maybe this is a way, I mean, this is a group of people I want to lead. I need an yeah. army and there's other things yeah. working around, but what do you think overall in that space? I think so. I think it's probably part of all, all of it is, you know, she's got it. She still wants the dark saber. It's here. She needs a group of people. They're there. Um, she's got the leverage of explaining that there is a mythosaur and I know where it is. That's super important to this group. Right. So check the box there. So I don't, I mean, I don't know that she's really necessarily compiling all these things. I think they're just kind of adding up and it's going to help her kind of make a decision one way or the other about what she does with all of this. I think uh, in the larger narrative, especially again, looking ahead to, you know, at some point going to back to Navarro, you know, we've got to tackle that. How does that play into any of this? How does the fact that how do they get back to Mandalore? Like, why would they go back to Mandalore at this point? That's another question. I don't know the answer to. It seems a little nebulous. So how would they get back there uh, if they do? It would be a shame, though, because that's all we got from Mandalore. And it wouldn't play into this whole thing about reuniting the group and, and all that. I mean, there's, there's scenes that are coming up still that I, I think we could still do that. I just don't know how we get there. But right. yeah, looking at the signet, I think it's just a reminder of what she saw and 
like how her faith is is starting to shift and change a little bit. Maybe not shift and change, but you know, we talked about on that that line, right? That bar of where your religion is and where your faith is, and maybe it's just moving over a little bit, you know, more to, to the central centric uh, as opposed to the far right, where it's probably been for a very long time for her. One of these ideas of potential like divine intervention, right? Some sometimes you are given a sign so strong that you just can't you, you can't you just can't ignore it anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, and like you said, losing her home, seeing them at the sore, being invited, you know, bathing even if indirectly or not intentionally, coming back into a group of people that maybe she could eventually lead under the right circumstances. And you're right, all these things are just falling into place. You can't you can't ignore divine intervention in some kind of way or, or some sort of, of the force. Will of the force. Will of the force. There you go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Will of the Mandalore at this point. Will of the dark saber. But yeah. anyway, it yeah, it's just it's just too many things, right? But it's just interesting to try to feel your way through what she's thinking. And the the question that came to mind though, at the end of the day, is will she betray this group of people on some level at some point? Will she betray the trust of all of them and this this gift they've kind of given to her unexpectedly and un, didn't ask for it and a bit unrequited as well. Do you think that she'll turn on them in some way or b- betray the, this generosity and this, this welcoming that they've given her? I don't think so. Like in my heart now, as much as I want Mando to be the Mandalore, I've been kind of, I started saying last episode, I think I'm starting to kind of shift away from that a little bit more. I still, I think I'm starting to get more on board with Bo-Katan like what a what a way for her to like come full circle, right? Having the dark saber and really not having the skills or the power or whatever it is that she needed to kind of be the leader of Mandalore. But I like this idea that through Din Djarin's intervention and spending time with this cult, with the sorry, with the watch or children of the watch, that she starts to realize that really the best way to kind of bring these people is to get to know them. Because I think she's been sitting on this throne for so long, ruling, I have the saber and that's all I really need. You need to fall in line because I am heir to the empire kind of thing. That's a very different, like that's not going to work for the Mandalorians. And I think that's what she found out. I mean, even the armorer said that she was the reason why they were in this predicament in the first place. Her house was exactly the reason why. And then you come into that house where this one person had that view and now has completely changed their tune. And I believe, I genuinely, sincerely believe they're going to be as giving as they possibly can, as though she were family, as though she's been a part of this group for so long. And I think that's going to really open her eyes to like, okay, yeah, these people are probably still crazy, but their heart's in the right place, right? And this may be the first part of getting to know this group and her realizing that she's just going to have to get to know all the other groups too, that leading isn't about just having, like you said, the symbols, right? That's, it's more than that. Uh, Maybe this is an opportunity for her to kind of take those first steps and really trying to understand what is it about all of these different groups that makes us so different and how do I bring them together? That's more powerful. That's more, it's easier for her to, to rise to power with that approach than just simply saying, this is my birthright as Paz said, right. Or as she was saying when she had the dark saber. So I can kind of see where that maybe this is those, these are those first steps and she could be a nice intermediary, right? A nice liaison to the other group saying, look, these guys really aren't that bad. I spent time with them. I broke bread with them. This is really what they mean. They're good hearted people, even if they don't take their helmet off and they smell whatever we it all, is. We all ate under our masks together. <laughs> That's why, yeah, exactly. They have ways of getting around this stuff, but they're really not bad people. And so we really need to open our eyes and, and kind of accept them as, you know, as Mandalorians, like everybody else. Right. So I'm, I'm, there's a lot here. I'm, I'm, I know and we're not going to get all this in what we're almost at the halfway mark at this point. Right. So I don't know that we're going to get all that, but maybe, maybe this is the start of all that for her. Yeah. Yeah. But there you have it. I mean, we, we've talked almost two hours and on an episode that was a bit more polarizing than, than maybe other episodes we've had of really any series to date. I think just because a little bit unique of an episode, I think, especially for Mandalorian. But again, a lot of depth to it, clearly. We don't talk about two hours about everything or anything, right? Mm-hmm. That was a total lead in that you missed because, yeah, we talk about two hours. for No, it's two hours and everything. everything. I know we about everything, but. Yeah, but still, I mean, but again, there's a lot of depth here. There's a lot of different directions it can go, a lot of speculation about what it means and how this will continue to you know, resolve itself over time. Quick question for you. I don't want it to go unsa- or unanswered. Rob had threw this out earlier, and I meant to come back to it, but he had asked earlier about why did Kane keep the box that they took from the Star Destroyer? 
and I don't, I don't know that she kept it. I like, so I have a, a guess that one theory would be that she kept it because they want to use, they want to use that equipment for a lab uh, remotely somewhere else. And she's going to provide that to whoever that person is, or they didn't keep it. And it really was just part of this whole kind of let's frame this guy and, and make sure he's, you know, genuine, but it almost, I can see, um, I guess I can see one theory that she was trying to get him to get all the equipment that somebody else needed, but she didn't have the intelligence to do it. Now that she has it, Oh, it disappeared. Sorry. I don't know where it went to. It was going to be decommissioned anyways, or destroyed. So no big deal. And then they, you know, pass that off to somebody else and they start cloning there. Right. Or she provides that to whoever's still doing the cloning experiments uh, for the empire. Yeah, I think so. I think it was more of a making sure they had the right type of equipment. Not necessarily, even though it was a bit of a starter kit, getting the, the, the boots grounded because it really, if they knew what they were looking for, or they felt like they had the right experience, they couldn't, they could have gone and raided a starter story or anytime they wanted to. Right. They, they could have made the, the rounds to get out there. They appear to have the connection. How else is she getting back and forth without being caught, without tickets and all this other stuff? You know, clearly she's done this before. So it would just make sense that they needed that speciality from him to say, okay, what are the, what are the pieces of this kit that are really important for us to get started with? And then let's tie up a loose end. Now, granted, mm -hmm. they could have just subjugated him and, and brought him along and kidnapped him basically and gone that route. Why they didn't do that that's kind of the empire way too so there, there are holes in the argument either which way you go but yeah, yeah it was a it, it I, I think it was i think you're on the money there i think it's more that they just need to make sure they get the right type of equipment and then they'll set the whole thing up but yeah no um again a lot to discuss in this episode some really great world building that hopefully will play off uh, either in this series or you know future episodes or seasons or maybe in future series that are yet to come and more importantly i think this is a really good uh, story development for Bo-Katan and Din Djarin, uh, uh, on top of everything else, even though they had smaller moments in this episode. Some good stuff there. Now, where this goes next episode, I, you got me, man. I mean, it's it feels like we're kind of in uh, uncharted territory at this point. All we know is we're going back to Navarro, at least from this, the stuff that we've seen. But how this plays out with all the other theories is going to be interesting to see. So maybe we'll kind of whack some of that on the next episode here or, or in between. But. Yeah, actually, that's a great lead in because you know, we want to do a QA and a show here pretty soon. So if we want to hear what everyone else's questions are in the audience of what are, what are the questions you have going into the second half of Mandalorian? What do you got going on for the rest of Bad Batch? What are the questions you want answered that you think maybe we have the answers for? Or you just want to hear our thoughts on it. So if you want to submit those questions to us, cantinacast.com slash question, a small form out there. If you want to fill that out, we'd love to hear from you. When we get enough questions there, we'll put together a, a quick show and and feed those back to y'all. So it'd be really curious to hear what y'all's thoughts are though. And again, if you have thoughts, use that form to share them with us too. I'd love to hear it. You know what we'd love to hear, Jonesy? What do we love to hear, Albert? We'd love to hear from all the people that are in our live chat every time we do a live recording of our episodes. Absolutely. And before we do that, a special thank you to our Patreon members, many of which who are in the live stream tonight. Uh, now part of the tribe members, Mike, Rob, Lauren, Dante, Risk, Justin, Jackson, Sharkman, Dan, Daz, Isabella, Uncle Leon, and Josh. And of course, the delusions of grandeur members, Ryan and Kathy, thank you all so much. And again, if you are curious about coming out and checking out the live stream, Sundays and Thursdays, we are usually live at 9 p.m. Central Time. And tonight, we and that's at cantinacast.com slash YouTube. And if you'd like to join one of all, all of these amazing people that we had tonight, Larry, Steph, Gary, Jonathan, Kathy, Music Train, Rob, Cube Dude, Lauren, Miss Sunflower, JJ Skywalker, Dale, Sky, Katya, Jorge, Risk, Ken D, Qui-Gon J, Hard Countered, um, Beacon Holiday, if I missed anyone, my sincerest apologies, not intentional. There were a lot of, man, a fantastic chat tonight. We had a lot of people in the background as well. Thank you all for coming out and checking it out. Other things that you guys need to be aware of. Uh, Jedi Novel Archive over on the YouTube channel. Again, cantinacast.com slash YouTube. Lauren posted uh, a preview. She's kind of getting ready and amped up for Ahsoka. So she's got a new Dawn review out there, kind of a look back at that book. Arguably still one of the best uh, or at least people's one of the most favorite books in recent memory. Uh, of course, a good Rebels book, Hera, Kanan, all that good stuff. So you're going to want to go out there and check that out. It's a great review. Uh, again, cantinacast.com slash YouTube. Also, Jeditorials. Stephanie posted one out there about kind of responsible for it, kind of the psychological aspect with Anakin. So you want to go check that out at cantinacast.com. And then, of course, Albert flashed this on the screen before. We're talking about our Patreon members. If you are curious about Patreon, getting early access to our regular release shows, as well as exclusive content, 
cantinacast.com slash Patreon. We'll get you everything you need to know to check all of that content out. Okay. Well, with that, we will be back in a few days because we've got to talk about Pabu. Pabu. Which turned out to not be the droid. No, it turned out to be a place. <laughs> That's okay, though. We kind of figured it was a place. Yeah. For the most part. It was just fun. We figured it was to- something about that, right? So we, we got that right. That's yeah, true. We did say it was going to be something. We said it was going to be something. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. Thanks for being here, everybody. Tell your friends about us. Uh, we'll see you guys here in just a few days to cover the Bad Batch. You're still listening? Wow. That's amazing. Well, I'm here to give you the disclaimer. Normally, we do a big, long, drawn-out disclaimer thing saying what's what and who's what and all that other stuff, but I think you guys kind of know that Lucasfilm and Disney have uh, no affiliation with us at all, uh, and we have none with them. Uh, We talk about Star Wars, which is their property and all that other good, fun stuff, Uh, but I think you can tell which is our stuff and which is their stuff. If you can't, well, then send a lawyer to send an email to me, and I'll be glad to chat with them. Other than that, you know what's what, so that's your disclaimer. 